Good morning and welcome to the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners meeting of April the 9th, 2019. We're happy that you're here with us this morning. And we'll start our um, invocation by Reverend Becky Robbins Penniman from the Church of the Good Shepherd in Dunedin. And I'd ask you to stand and then thereafter the Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Vice Chairman Pat Gerard. Thank you. Let us pray. Creating God, how beautiful is the universe you have made, how awesome is your handiwork. And you have committed the care of this stunning planet to our care. May we always be worthy of your trust. We give you thanks for the proven, dedicated stewards of your creation, especially those who teach us to use our water wisely and conserve and protect our parks and recreation sites so that our children's children's children enjoy the same abundant natural resources as we do. We also ask you to bless those who have a servant's heart, the volunteers who have given countless hours to this community as they care for animals yearning to have a forever home, or swing into action when disaster strikes, or help us appreciate the rich history and heritage of our county, and in so many other self-giving ways, as well as the dedicated public servants who guide them all. As the members of the Board of County Commissioners take up their work, we ask you to give them wisdom to face problems with clarity, the broad-mindedness to find solutions with creativity, a sense of gratitude for the resources under their care, and the determination to respect the dignity of every human being. We ask your blessing this day and, and every day on all who serve in county government and our entire community, whether they work, live, or visit in this corner of your paradise. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Um, we have several presentations and awards, which I will um, come down front and... We're very pleased that this is National Volunteer Week, and we'll be honoring some of our very dedicated volunteers. To a lot of people to honor. Um, so first of all, I'm going to um, do a proclamation to recognize National Volunteer Week. And um, at this point, I'd like to ask the site coordinators and volunteers from Animal Services, Emergency Management, Heritage Village, Parks and Conservation Resources, and Human Resources to join me at the podium. They will be accepting the proclamation on behalf of all the volunteer services staff in Pinellas County. Come on. We'll just have you come over this way. <laughs> Nobody wants to. Come all the way around. So we can make a semicircle. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you all for being Good here. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Okay, what a nice crown. During National Volunteer Week, we celebrate the spirit of compassion and generosity that drives us to care for others. Volunteering one's time, talents, and resources has been an integral part of our American heritage since the early days of our nation, and it is essential that we continue this tradition of giving and sharing to preserve and improve the quality of life for all citizens in our communities. Volunteers affect real change in our neighborhoods, our community, and here in our county by investing their time, energy, and valuable skills, and they develop innovative approaches to address many of the concerns and needs of our county. Individuals and communities are the center of social change, discovering their power to make a difference. It is increasingly more evident that our nation's greatest resource is its people. 
1,524 volunteers worked a total of 2,004, 180 hours during fiscal year 2018 in the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners departments only, saving the taxpayers more than $5 million. Now that's pretty incredible, don't you think? The County Commission appreciates The County Commission appreciates its volunteers and encourages citizens to become involved in their communities, neighborhoods, and local government. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that the week of April the 7th to the 13th, 2019, be recognized as National Volunteer Week, which is just wonderful. So I'd like, um, I'm going to ask part two for some volunteers to stay, but in the meantime, I'd like you all to introduce yourselves. My name is Cantrice Harmon, and I work in Human Resources Volunteer Services Program. Rusty Walker, I work for Animal Services. Thank you. I'm Jonathan Skinner. I'm the Volunteer Program uh, Manager for the Parks and Conservation Resources Department. Irina Karolak, Human Resources. Don Nolan, volunteer. Betty Nolan, volunteer. Keith Holland with Parks Department. Dave Rocco, volunteer in emergency management. Tom Powers, volunteer emergency management. Clayton Parrott, emergency management, uh, amateur radio coordinator. Judy Daly, volunteer Heritage Village. Sue Schneck, volunteer coordinator Heritage Village. Thank you all. So there's five volunteers that I would like to have stay with us. Judy Daly, Thomas Powers, Betty Nolan, Don Nolan, and David Rockwell. You're all important, but in particular we have um, a reason to honor um, these particular volunteers. And we are today honoring these volunteers who have gone above and beyond. The prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award is bestowed on those who have contributed 4,000 volunteer hours or more to their community. To give us some perspective, 4,000 hours is equivalent to 500 full-time work days. <coughs> so more than almost, you know, almost a year and a half. That's quite an achievement. So um, the volunteers we honor today have truly made a difference in improving the quality of life for the citizens of our community. So Judy Daly has volunteered at Heritage Village since 2012. Thomas Powers has been volunteering at Heritage Village and Emergency Management since 2014. Betty Nolan has been volunteering at the Parks Department since 2001. <laughs> Don Nolan decided to follow her and has been volunteering at the Parks Department since 2006. And finally, David Rockwell has been volunteering at emergency management since 2013. I know I speak from the heart, from the county commission, and from our citizens to thank you sincerely for all the hours that you give and the love and kindness you bestow upon um, our departments and where you volunteer. Would anybody like to say anything? I, just as a volunteer, I'd like to say that during, during the time we've served, we've met some wonderful county people and some wonderful other volunteers which is great which is what it's all about but thank you so much for giving of your time and talents so <laughs> these 
draw a certificate of appreciation. As our volunteers leave us, um, again, we sincerely thank them and encourage each and every one of you in the room to follow their example and to volunteer um, within the county. Okay, next we have Water Conservation Month proclamation. And I'd like to ask Water Conservation Compliance Officers Jeremy King and Kevin Tank from the Utilities Department to join me at the podium and they'll be accepting the proclamation on behalf of the citizens of Pinellas County. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Clean, safe, and sustainable water resources are vital to Pinellas County's economy, the environment, and our people. The state of Florida, the Southwest Florida Water Management District, Tampa Bay Water, and Pinellas County are working together on a daily basis to increase awareness about the importance of water conservation. Pinellas County and the state of Florida have designated April, which is typically a dry month, except for this morning, <laughs> um, when water demands are most acute as Water Conservation Month to educate our citizens about saving precious water resources. We are constantly reminded that Florida's water resources, no matter how diverse, must have improved management strategies. So every business, industry, homeowner, and visitor can make a difference when it comes to conserving our vital water resources. And this is something that you all and we all should be most proud of. Pinellas County citizens have managed to reduce their personal daily consumption of potable water from 153 gallons in 1990 to 68 gallons in 2018. That's pretty incredible and we thank each and every one of you for doing your part. <laughs> now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that April 2019 be recognized as Water Conservation Month and that we all continue to observe and try to reach that goal of 68 gallons. Thank you. <laughs> Not necessarily a renewable resource. And we have an abundance of it here in Pinellas County, but we still should take the time, especially with the reclaim water. I don't know if anybody lives in a reclaim area. But um, education is the biggest thing we're going for right now. And a lot of people, me included, Kevin probably, not a lot of people look at the back of the books and look what our laws are, you know. That's what we have the county ordinance for. And uh, if you just tell your neighborhoods, tell your HOAs, just to try to please just follow the rules, you know. That's what they're there for, and they're for everybody. They're not just for us, and they're for everybody to take part of, and we can all conserve as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. That's a great message. How about you? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 all right, we'll um, get a picture as well with the county commissioners. Two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, this is kind of a cool award. It comes with a beautiful stepping stone. This is our Community Waterwise Awards. And this was started in 1998 to recognize property owners who are leading the way in outdoor water conservation. The winning landscapes each year are excellent examples of Florida-friendly landscaping practices at work. And you can Google this and also start to follow their practices. This annual awards program is a partnership between Tampa Bay Water, Pinellas County Extension's Florida-friendly landscaping program, and Pinellas County Utilities. So this year, we're recognizing two winners in the single family residential category and one winner in the demonstration garden category. So at this point, I'd like to ask Brian Neiman, who is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent with the Pinellas County Extension to join me to present the Garden Stepping Stone to the winners. Hello. Hi, nice to see you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Okay, so the first, um, 2018 Community Waterwise Award in the residential category is presented to Owen O'Leary of Clearwater. Heavier every year. Oh my goodness. Wow. Very nice. So Owen has been working on beautifying his landscape for approximately eight years and transition from away from all turf grass over five years ago. He decided to create a yard made entirely of shrubs, here we go, wow. trees and ground covers. The landscape exists primarily on rainfall with occasional well water being applied by hand during the drought. Thank you. <laughs> Owen does all the landscape management himself and his landscape serves as a model for how to create a healthy an attractive landscape that provides wildlife habitat within an urban setting. So thank you on behalf of the Pinellas County residents for what you've done, and this is just beautiful. Thank you. So, any tips for anyone? Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, that's <laughs> heaven. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, my yard is an ecosystem, mm -hmm. and it's connected to Pinellas County. And I really, really enjoy when Pinellas County uh, uh, utility workers stop and say hello at my yard. And one guy in a big, big truck looked down at me and he said, you know, I watered the hell out of my yard and I can't get it to look like yours. And I explained that I don't water my yard. It's all about uh, drought tolerant plants. Absolutely. Uh, extension services are critical to the learning experience, and everybody's on the learning curve. So, thank you, Brian. Thank you for saying that, Owen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Let's get a picture with this heavy stepping stone. Show us the. Can you show us the? Oh, very nice. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Love that. This was made by an artist at the Safety Harbor Art and Music Center. Wow. So made, made by a local artist as well. Very nice. Yeah, Thank awesome. you. Congrats. Oh, this David's not here either. Yeah, he is. Oh, yes. oh okay. Yeah, he's here. All right. Okay, the second 2018 Community Waterwise Award in the residential category is presented to David Grunewald of Kenneth City. Would you like to come forward, David? Good morning. Hi, nice to meet you too. You've lived in your home for 30 years and you've slowly built an urban oasis during that time as well. 
your site was not conducive to growing turf grass, so you decided to create a yard made entirely of shrubs, trees, and ground covers. The landscape is watered on an as-needed basis during the driest parts of the year with well water. Oh my goodness, isn't that lovely? Wow. Oh, you even have room for your stepping stone. Actually, I do. Yeah. <laughs> David's landscape is a gem within Pinellas County, and we'd like to thank him for his hard work on behalf of all of our residents. So, wow. Would you like to hand this over and say anything <laughs> about how you created it? <laughs> Hang on to it. Uh, yeah, it's been a 30-year work in progress, and uh, I have two passions. One is gardening, and one is golf. And I like to be outside. So uh, I'd like to also thank the commission and Brian and his group for allowing me to take the award. And I'll continue to do a lot of work in my yard. <laughs> well, it's on a commercial landscape. Oh, you are? Uh, so uh, I've been doing that for over 30 years. Well, you have, you have created the perfect oasis mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. They already took it off the screen, but <laughs> That's all right. it's, um, there it is. That was a small <laughs> shot of what, it, what it's, it's actually there. It's just a small shot of your That's entire just a yard. Side yard. Just a side yard. Wow. Wow. I love the ferns and thank you. it's just beautiful. So, well, thank you very much, and we'll get a picture with you as well. Okay, so we also have a Master Gardener program, and so um, um, the last award is the Community Garden category, and it's being presented to Melinda Vargas, Leslie Zambito, Karen Brown, and Shari Borarski for their work at Wall Springs Park, which is one of our county parks. Will you come forward, please? Oh, the fairies, <laughs> the garden fairies. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can. <laughs> so the Wall Springs Park Butterfly, Butterfly Garden has been existen in existence for over three years, and it's maintained through the efforts of volunteers with the Pinellas County Master Gardener Program. This garden serves as an excellent model for homeowners who are also <laughs> interested in creating wildlife habitat in their homes. Um, it's, this garden is a wonderful asset to our parks system, and I encourage you to visit Wall Springs. And I'd like you all to tell us a little bit more. I know that you do other projects around the county because I've seen your good works before. Anyone? <laughs> well, we also do educational programs. Mm -hmm. um, I personally do butterfly talks and talks on uh, vegetable gardening. Um, just such a good educational thing for us to do to teach the public how to you know, be ecologically correct in what we do. Thank you. How about you? I'd like to say um, that we took over the Wall Springs Park in March of 2018, and there was literally nothing there. Um, we are working there like every Wednesday, hundreds of hours between us, and we are currently seeking out funding because everything so far has been coming out of our own pockets. So um, we can make... Um, a difference, but we could make a big difference if we got the community to help us with donations. And do you have a website, or do you have some way of being in contact, or can you help us with that? <laughs> well, yes, we do. Yeah, I'm Teresa Badurk, and I'm the Master Gardener Coordinator here in Pinellas County. And at the Pinell, um, the University of Florida IFAS Extension Pinellas County website, there's a link under the Lawn and Garden tab for Master Gardener uh, Volunteer Program. And there is a place where you can donate, and uh, you can actually indicate that you'd like it specifically to go to the Wall Springs Butterfly Garden if you like. So thank you guys very much. These, these, they do wonderful work there in that place. Every time I visit, it's just growing and growing. 
It's wonderful. So thank you. Yes, come visit them. I might have to invite you to our house. We're trying to do a vertical garden, so one of those drip gardens. Um, so far, we're successful with lettuce, lots of jalapenos. So we're ready to <laughs> harvest and um, can them. And um, so, but nowhere near probably the beauty of what you've created in Wild Springs. And so we thank you. We'll take a picture. Okay, so finally, um, we have our Doing Things Employee Recognition Award. And today, we're honoring Bobby Burke. So I'd like um, our administrator, Barry Burton, and Bobby, would you like to join me here at the podium, please? Hi, thank you. Nice to see you. Our employees work hard every day to make our community better. In an ongoing video program, we recognize as individuals who exemplify the dedication of our Pinellas County team. It's only through our employees and the excellent work they do that we can fulfill our vision, which is to be the standard for public service in America. So when one of our utilities customers has a water leak, Bobby Burke is often the first person to arrive at their home. As a utilities maintenance specialist, Bobby responds to after hours calls throughout the county, working quickly to solve the problem and restore service. You've been with the county since 2003, and you've ensured that the county's utilities department continues to exceed customer expectations on a daily basis. So with that, we'll show you a video that's a snapshot of the work that Bobby does every day. When the water goes out, Bobby Burke will be there, whether it's the afternoon or the middle of the night. We're a first responder crew, so when people call in about water leaks or sewer stoppages or any kind of problems with, related to that, I'll go out and see what the problem is and fix it if I can. A longtime utilities maintenance specialist, Bobby has seen it all. It could be as simple as a customer accidentally shutting off their water to a tree root crushing up. underground pipes, or worse. If you have a leak um, at the water main, you have to dig through about you know three or four feet of mud and you're gonna get dirty. As Bobby reviews each day's service requests, he's always ready for a new challenge. It's never the same thing. It's a different part of the county, it's different people, it's a different problem. This is my office, you know, I have a rolling office. What's up, man? Bobby joined the county in 2003. He says he enjoys working on a team that's not afraid to get a little dirty to get the job done. In addition to his technical know-how, the job also requires a human touch as he meets customers, sometimes at very odd hours. Kind of like the face of the county, you know. I'm not on the phone, I'm right in front of them. Bobby says it's satisfying to know you've been able to change someone's day, and some of them let him know it. That they appreciate what I've done, and uh, occasionally they'll... Uh, fill out that little card and send it in. For Bobby, every day is a new opportunity to exceed his customers' expectations. I'm Bobby Burke, and I'm Pinellas County.
So I'd like to ask you, what is the most unusual situation you've encountered? Uh, <clears throat> just like water blowing 30 feet in the air or <laughs> <laughs> things like that. Fire okay. hydrants getting knocked off and there's a big like pool. Because people have crashed into them yeah. or something of that nature. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Well, like you said, that you're the face of the county. When somebody's having an issue, they're, they're looking for someone to resolve it, and you're there. And so I know they appreciate, and on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for what you do. Great job, thank you. Keep doing your great fairy work. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're sprinkling magic all over the place, <laughs> attracting those butterflies and beautiful landscapes. Okay, next is our partner presentation, and we are proud to present the 2018 annual audit. And I'd ask um, Claritha Harris, who is our Chief Deputy Director of the Finance Division and the Clerk of the Circuit Court, to introduce our next guest. And before she do does so, Claritha is going to be retiring this year, unfortunately. So this will be her last official presentation of an audit on behalf of Pinellas County. And how many audits have you been through, Claritha? <laughs> Uh, well, as uh, chief, as uh, a part of the clerk's office, I've been through 26 audits. But prior to working for the clerk's office, I was actually the audit manager with Grant Thornton, who audited the county for the first 11 years under an external auditor. So I guess I've been associated with 37 county audits. 37? So. Yes. Wow. wow. But thank you, Commissioner Seal. Um, I'm happy to present to you this morning, um, along with John Weber, the, um, pr the presentation of the annual audit results. I'm doing this on behalf of Clerk Burke, who had a prior commitment this morning, um, a very important commitment uh, that uh, he, he was unable to get out of. And if you may recall, Clerk Burke is normally the one who gets up and talks about the audit results and kind of talks about them <laughs> and takes away some of what John, John intends to say, but that's, uh, he's, he's the clerk and controller, so he can do that. So, <laughs> but I won't do that this morning. I just want to tell you that um, um, Crow has been uh, the auditors for the county uh, for the last six consecutive years. Um, they were just awarded the contract again for this last year, and their contract um, extends for the next four years. And uh, we're very happy because uh, Crow always does a thorough and consistent job for the county. Um, in the audit, they're auditing not only the financial statements of the Board of County Commissioners, but all of the constitutional officers, um, and they'll talk more about that in detail in, in a bit. And um, as it's my uh, privilege to present to you this morning John Weber, partner with Crow. Thank you. Good morning. Right. How is everybody morning. today? Good. Great. I always clear out the room for some reason. <laughs> I like to come up. Most people uh, take off. So, yes, I'm here to talk about the uh, comprehensive annual financial report for the fiscal year ended uh, 2018. Uh, this is the actual 203 page document I'm going to walk through with you today. Well, I'm not going to go over every page. So. Um, but, um, uh, yes, this is prepared by uh, Claritha and her team. 
Uh, they do an excellent job putting this document together, uh, as well as helping us with uh, getting through the audit process. So I'm going to go over with you the audit results, uh, a little bit on the financial statement uh, overview, a couple of future pronouncements, and then uh, some comparative data uh, that I provide to you. The independent auditor's report uh, on the comprehensive annual financial report is an unmodified or otherwise referred to as a clean audit opinion. Uh, that means all the numbers in the financials are reasonably stated uh, and presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. We issue an independence auditor's report on internal control over compliance. This is done in accordance with government auditing standards. And here we're uh, just evaluating if, if we determine throughout the audit process we find any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in internal control. And I am happy to report to you we do not have any material weaknesses or significant deficiencies in controls. The independent auditor's report on federal and state grants. Uh, here we are auditing uh, the federal funds you receive as well as the state uh, grant funds you receive. And our goal here is to determine that you complied uh, with federal as well as state uh, laws and regulations. And happy to report to you, again, an unmodified opinion. Uh, that means you complied with the requirements applicable to, to those grants. Uh, in addition, we do not have any uh, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, findings, or question costs. So, uh, wonderful uh, audit results, um, and everybody should be very happy uh, and certainly proud of their finance department uh, for, for achieving these results. Uh, as Claritha mentioned, we do uh, audit um, uh, all of the um, uh, elected officials, uh, as well as issue some separate reports. Uh, so these are all listed here. Um, I'm not going to walk through all of them with you, but they are uh, separate reports for all the constitutional officers, uh, as well as a couple other funds of the county. Uh, so those are also clean, unmodified opinions on those audit reports. Uh, we do determine uh, if the county complied uh, with a couple of Florida statutes. One is related to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the spending of those funds. Uh, the other one is investments of public funds. So we did uh, determine that the uh, county did comply uh, with all the requirements of the spending of the uh, uh, oil funds as well as the compliance with the uh, investment of public funds. Uh, we do a couple agreed upon procedures reports. Uh, one has to do uh, with the accounts receivable write-off um, procedures, uh, and the second one is the solid waste uh, facility uh, letter, and we had no, no findings, no exceptions related to that. So again, everything uh, all clean uh, with all of the opinions. A quick overview of some of the financial uh, information. Uh, this uh, slide here is uh, for the governmental activities. Uh, so what we're talking about here is uh, some of the major funds would be the general fund, the sheriff's fund, capital projects, and emergency medical service, as well as all the other governmental funds of the county. Uh, so you ended the year with about $2.9 billion of assets. You're probably going to cross that $3 billion uh, this year, I would think. Uh, the liabilities were about $1.5 billion, and then the net position is the same, about $1.5 billion. On the right-hand side, we broke out the actual net position for you. Um, the investment in capital assets is pretty close to $2 billion. Uh, the restricted is $344 million. Uh, some of the larger items are restrictions for uh, capital projects, EMS, transportation, first development. Uh, then you have the unrestricted. So it is in brackets. It is a negative number. So let me try to explain that uh, to you here a little bit. Uh, the reason for the negative number is really related to two items. One is the net pension liability, uh, which three years, a new accounting standard required that the county record their portion of the net pension liability of the Florida retirement system. That amount is about $480 million. This year, we had another new standard that came into effect. Uh, this is GASB statement number 75, um, other post-employment benefits. So the county is now required to record as a liability the actuarial determination for future other post-employment benefits. And OPEB, as we refer to it, is mainly related to health care and what's going to be made available to retirees uh, at, at, at the county. That figure uh, in, for the governmental activities was about $708 million uh, that has been added to the statement in that position for the county. So those two numbers together equal almost $1.2 billion. 
while I cannot take those numbers away, uh, if they were not there, you would have a positive net position of about $328 million, okay? Madam Chair, mm -hmm. thank you so much for, is the on? Thank you so much for pointing out those intricacies in that number. My question is, given all of the audits that you do with entities like ours, is that an extraordinary number? Uh, no, that is a very typical number. Um, okay. So uh, all the governments uh, <coughs> I work with, um, you know, it depends on the size of the government and the number of employees uh, in the government. Um, but everyone this year has added these significant hundreds of millions of dollars of, of liabilities. These are not funded plans. That's why the liabilities are there. And um, I don't have any clients that actually fund uh, the OPEB plans. They're basically on, on a pay-as-you-go basis. So as you incur the cost each year, you pay for them each year, and each year you're budgeting for those um, estimated costs for the particular year. So I have a follow-up, Madam Chair. So, uh, and I apologize if this sounds like, you know, a bit off, but those costs are not costs that we can necessarily control, correct? Well, the pension liability, no. Uh, the OPEB liability, um, some yes and some no. It, uh, the state has requirements and what you need to offer, um, but there's, there's, you know, the county has... Uh, plans in place that are allowing for these other post-employment benefits that is a matter of policy. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, this next slide is the uh, business type activities. So the major funds here are the water, sewer, solid waste fund, and then there's other uh, funds included here as well. Uh, again, the assets are, are close to about $2 billion. Uh, liabilities, $322 million and a net position of almost $1.7 billion. On the right-hand side, uh, the investment in capital assets, almost $1.4 uh, billion. Uh, restricted is uh, $8 million. This is restricted for debt service uh, requirements. And then your unrestricted is a, is a positive $300 million. Uh, so uh, again, here uh, included in that is a $29 million net pension liability. And then the uh, OPEB liability is about uh, $65 million. My quick highlights here for you, uh, the general fund. Uh, actual revenues were about $576 million for the year. You had budgeted, uh, budgeted about five seventy three, dollars uh, so you were positive to your budget of almost uh, $3.9 million. On the expenditure side, you had $237.7 million with a budget of two sixty seven point four. dollars so you were, uh, had a positive variance again. You did not spend as much as you did budget by about $29 million. For the Sheriff's Operations Fund, the actual revenue is a little over $20 million. Uh, the budget was 19.8, so positive, again, on the revenue side of about 765,000. Expenditures for the Sheriff were about 314 million uh, with a budget of 316, and so it was positive there as well of almost uh, 2 million. And then the EMS, uh, the revenues, uh, again, about 120, Budget 115, so that was positive. Uh, expenditures had a positive variance as well. So all of the um, variances were positive on the revenue side as, as well as the expenditure side for the year. Uh, the right-hand side here, this is the major enterprise funds. Uh, so we're showing you, you here the operating revenues, operating expenses, and then the operating income. So just when looking at this, this does not include any interest income or interest expense. It's basically the operations of uh, to, to run the water, sewer, and solid waste system. Uh, so the water was uh, positive about $4 million this year, uh, sewer $12 million, and solid waste about $14 million. I know you love these uh, Gasby pronouncements because I always put these big numbers on your books. Uh, so we have two new ones for uh, the fiscal year ended September 30th and 19th. The good news is uh, these are not going to really have any effect on your financial statements. We're not going to add any more liabilities. And um, it's going to be a little bit on footnote disclosure, but nothing, nothing uh, that's uh, you know, uh, going to make major changes here to your finances. All right, so some of the comparative uh, information uh, that's going to follow here. Uh, this is taken from 2017 uh, comprehensive <laughs> annual financial reports of um, other counties. Uh, that's the latest information publicly available. 
All of the 18 reports are not yet filed, so I don't have, can't get my hands on them yet. Um, and uh, uh, some of the budget information we actually cannot get from uh, the reports, but we're presenting the ones we could get for you, okay? So uh, this is some of this is from the statistical section in the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Uh, the county government employees uh, ended at about, or this year was 5821, uh, 5739 last year, uh, so about an increase of 82. Uh, residents per county government employee, you see it was 167 for 18 or 169 uh, for 17. Uh, just remember here, the higher the number, I look at is better. Uh, that means you have one uh, county employee for every 167 residents, okay? The general fund uh, ended the year with a fund balance of about $118 million. Uh, that was a $1.5 million increase uh, over 2017. And then on the right-hand side, the number of months, expenditures, and transfers out. And the reason we include the transfers out is that's where the uh, numbers are recorded that you're transferring to the elected officials for, for operations. Um, and then uh, you have about 2.4 uh, months of expenditures and transfers out in your fund balance. Okay? And then I always end with your, your all favorite slide. Um, so the, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the outstanding debt. So this would be bonds, notes, loans, or any capital leases. Uh, for the county was $145 million uh, decrease of about $8.5 million uh, compared to last year. And then you see your debt per capita uh, ended at, in 2018 at basically $150. So you can see there's a low of $150 and a high of $1,383 here. It's, so it's very, very low, very low debt um, uh, at the county. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Does anybody have any questions? Nice to have a good clean audit. Absolutely. And also, I think we're always proud of the uh, last uh, page of the presentation that shows that we generally pay as we go, and we are very conservative as far as our debt, um, and it's only for part of our sewer system. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is always a beautiful slide. And John, you do a great job. I don't know why we don't Thank take you. a photo with the auditor. Yeah. <laughs> Taking yeah. photos of everyone else. <laughs> well, we should do that. Um, but that slide, again, we always talk about the impact of the penny for Pinellas, and that slide reflects that. Um, I have one other question, but before I get there, because I don't want to forget, I just want to thank Claritha for your magnificent work. Um, certainly since I joined the board, you've been here. And uh, just um, the ultimate professional. And I just want to thank you for your service. When are you leaving? I, we can still do an ordinance to prevent that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm uh, hopefully the end of July. Um, but, Commissioner, um, thank you for your kind words. But I just want to acknowledge the work of all of the staff of the finance division um, in putting together this CAFR. And this morning we have with us Jeanette Phillips, who's director of finance. And Jeanette, if you could please stand. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Jeanette will be sitting up here with you when I retire, because she'll be promoted to my position. So I just wanted to, uh, to say that. And I also wanted to acknowledge the work um, the, putting the, the, the CAFRA together and doing the overall county audit and provi providing the information to the auditors for the audit. This is a collaborative effort of all of the constitutional officers and their financial staff and all of the um, financial staff of the board <coughs> who contribute significantly to that to that effort. So we appreciate everybody's work in that. Well, thank you, Claritha. And, and the CAFR is a thing of beauty as well, uh, just like our budget documents. Is it on up on your website? Yes, it is. Website? The CAFR as well as the annual financial report that includes each one of the constitutional officers' separate financial reports and the citizen's guide, which is that report that we um, prepare for the citizens every year to give them just a snapshot of the financial results of the county. Thank you. Madam Chair, can I ask one question uh, of John? So on the, um, the slide with the negative uh, net position, yes. um, and you said that was due to part of it was employee medical, retiree medical, and the other was pension. pension. So 
seeing that all governments are basically in the same position, is there any negative result from that at all? Or is it just a, a Gatsby effect? Well, uh, it's probably mainly a, a, a Gatsby effect. Um, I, I, I really have not, uh, as I'm not a, an underwriter, uh, I, I'm not sure how those on Wall Street will uh, be looking at these liabilities in the future when governments look to issue debt. Uh, but since it is pretty common uh, that uh, most governments are not funding these liabilities, uh, that it's, you know, it's not like you're going to have 50 governments that are, have all this money set aside for these plans and, you know, you don't. Uh, so um, I think that's kind of something to be seen. Uh, Strictly down the road. a reporting issue. Correct, yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else? Thank you very okay. much. We Great. appreciate, um, again, <clears throat> the partnership with your company and the fact mm -hmm. that we have um, such a great financial picture to present to our citizens. Great. All righty. Thank, thank you Thank you much. for keeping everything so nice and clean and understandable. I just audited it. They keep it clean. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and thank you All again, Clarita. You're welcome. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you um, now we are at our public hearings, and we are sitting as the countywide planning authority. Are there any cards for? No. Okay. Um, first, we have item six. Agenda items six, seven, and eight are proposed amendments to the countywide plan map. The public hearings were properly advertised. Affidavit of publication have been received for filing. No correspondence has been received. The matters are properly before the authority to be heard. Okay, item six, um, I'm gonna take each one separately. Again, I have no cards, but if anyone wishes to speak on this agenda item, uh, please come forward. Okay, I'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. Um, motion by Commissioner Gerard and second by Commissioner Long. Uh, we'll open up the uh, voting ballots. Mine is not coming up. I guess I'm guilty. Huh? All right. Did you join? Yeah. I'm going to vote yes. I apologize. It's just not. I know. I'm up. having trouble as well. Oh, here we go. All right. We're all there. Unanimous vote. Thank you very much. We'll move on to agenda item seven, which is uh, case number CW1905. Um, is there anyone in the public who wishes to come forward and speak on this agenda item? We'll close the public hearing. Any questions? Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Eggers and second by Commissioner Gerard. I'm a yes vote. It's not coming up on my. There it is. What? You put it in. Okay, there we go. All seven unanimous vote. Agenda item eight, which is case number CW1906, City of St. Pete Beach. Um, again, opening it for public hearing. Is there anyone who wishes to comment on this agenda item? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Gerard and second by Commissioner Long. I'm a yes vote. Okay, it's a unanimous vote. Um, excellent. Moving on to agenda item nine. Item nine is a legislative petition to vacate submitted by Lisa Baith and uh -oh. Sharon Zomafell for the estate of Roger LaBelle for that portion of a 15-foot right-of-way lying south of Lot 12, Tampa and Tarpon Springs Land Company, Plat H. 
Platt Book H1, page 116. The public hearing was properly advertised after the date of publication has been received for filing. No letters of obje objection have been received. Um, all interested parties have been notified as of the date of the public hearing. No correspondence has been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Um, does anyone wish to speak on this agenda item? <laughs> Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Move approval. Second. A motion by Commissioner Gerard, a second by Commissioner Welch. I'm a yes. So it is a unanimous vote. Um, very good. That's the end of our public hearings. We now move on to the consent <coughs> agenda agenda which is items 10 through 29 does anyone wish to pull anything 22 22 25 25 move the balance I'm sorry I'd move the balance of the consent okay thank second. you um, motion by Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner Long for the balance of the consent agenda um, absent items 22 and 25 I'm a uh, yes. Nine again. Sorry. Can we pull up 10 through 29 with the exception of 22 and 25 for the consent agenda? It did. It showed up as agenda I number nine. It showed up as item nine. Okay. Huh? Okay, we can just do this um, verbally then. So um, I had a motion by Commissioner Welch. Uh, Welch and a second by Long. Commissioner Long. Welch and a second by, I think Long. it was Commissioner Gerard. Long. 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 Sorry. Long, sorry. Um, with the exception of 22 and 25, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Yep, there it is. Wait, that's 30. a different one. <laughs> no, this is the wrong item. Yeah. We're not on 30 yet. Okay, so let's um, agenda item 22. Yeah, uh, just if somebody could possibly just uh, go over what, what section of the trail this is, where we've been uh, south of the, the bridge that goes over 19. We're moving our way south, and I just want to make sure that there's no confusion on this and anything to the north of the bridge. So if somebody could just maybe give us a summary of... Staff will come forward and clarify item number 22, which is different than the item that is later on the agenda uh, down under item 40. Good morning. Uh, Ken Jacobs, Pinellas County Transportation. Uh, this item is for award of contract for the segment of the trail. It is part of the Duke Energy Trail. Uh, if you go to the overhead, uh, basically it's a, a missing segment between Sunset Point Road and Northeast Coachman <coughs> that goes down the Duke Energy Trail. Uh, previously we had completed the section north of there that connected the Enterprise overpass down to Sunset Point Road. And this one is coming up. What's, what's the next phase south? Where would that go? Is that going to go? Uh, we do have an intersection improvement at Northeast Coachman and coachman so this will connect to that intersection and then go in front of the ballpark okay connect to that section that then takes you down to bel-air and across to us 19 so the next section picks up south at haynes bay shore and us 19. okay so so this is the last little piece that and the intersection improvement that's yeah. that's currently under construction okay thank you appreciate mm -hmm. it thanks for the update. okay move approval on that second um Motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Justice. Just want to make a comment. I know I sent this agenda item to someone who's in the neighborhood of Coachman Ridge, and I would just ask that there be some further communication. We have it already going, but to make sure that the that neighborhood all understands exactly where the trail's going. They had a meeting there quite some time ago, but just a reminder of where it's going to go is great. Thank you. All right. The voting cards are up. 
I'm a yes. Okay, it's a unanimous vote for 22. Um, the next phase of the Duke Energy Florida Trail. Yay. Mm -hmm. All right, agenda item 25, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify that this is a, uh, a engineering study as far as to determine the location of our uh, regional stormwater project. That's correct. That's correct. So okay. this will give us the study to where they can regionalize these services um, and give us options. Okay. Yeah, the, the map, it wasn't 100% clear. There's a location arrow, and I realize it's the entire CRA, not a specific spot on the map. Just wanted to make sure that was clear for anyone else. And um, this is a great project moving forward for uh, helping the 28th Street and Joe's Creek and everything in there. So move approval. Second. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Eggers. And um, just wanted to note that this study is being funded by the Penny for Pinellas. <coughs> Voting cards are up. I'm a yes. Okay, it's a unanimous vote. Okay, moving on to the regular agenda, we have agenda item 30, Convention and Visitors Bureau. This is a um, submit, uh, capital funding uh, submittal from the DALI uh, for $17.5 million in net present value. Um, we're asking for authorization in accordance with our capital guidelines to conduct the due diligence by the county and the consultant and seek your approval to begin that process. Good morning. Good morning. Tim Ransberger, BSBC staff. Mr. Burton set this up, so I'll just skip ahead here. We have Mr. Uh, or Dr. Hank Hine here, who's the executive director of the Dolly Museum, who's here to, I believe, uh, say a few words and, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, what it's is a, the timeline this is a, this for this, and how will it um, how will it mesh with the other capital projects that have been submitted? So my understanding, this is the first uh, of its kind that we've uh, undertaken under the new guidelines. Uh, your consideration today will advance this to uh, review by the TDC with all the other applications. So the other four remaining or three remaining applications, total of four, will advance that through the process of consultant review, staff review, county attorney review, and obviously TDC review for okay. recommendations to, the, to your... So they'll basically all be in the same pipeline being considered by the consultant? Yes, ma'am. Under the new guidelines, uh, because this request is in excess of $10 million, it comes for a preliminary review by this, this commission at this time. Any questions? Move approval. Second. Okay. Okay, so it'll start moving through the process, and we will um, be um, considering what dollar amount, how it fits um, all the guidelines, and um, et cetera. So it next will go, once it goes to the consultant, back to the Tourist Development Council as the advisory group, and then um, to us at a future date. And I'll just, as a reminder, say to everybody, you know, we will, we have a lot of capital needs that have been indicated, and so we're going to have to be lining these all up to try to make some judicious decisions. So, Madam Chair, what is the total now? including this that in terms of applications i believe it's 22 million dollars i'm looking for bill burger here so Please. this in the back he's included. shaking his head yes yes 22 Please. million dollars and, and then of course you have the uh, city of Clearwater <coughs> and the phillies application which is on a different track and that's without the um phillies request yes ma'am and they'll each be Put through the legal review as well by Michael Zoss to see what meets the guidelines as well. Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was looking forward to getting to a deep conversation about capital funding guidelines. I'm disappointed, Commissioner Long. Well, I'm. <laughs> that I was have, facetious. I, hold on. Um, hold on. No, uh, I'm not going to give you that chance. Let no, me. No, wait a minute. Yes, question. you did. No. You opened it up. No, Madam but Chair. I'm still asking my question. So, where are we in the Dolly? In the 2.5 million that we were paying in $500,000 increments, have we finished that? Or I is believe there's still payments. I'll refer, um, defer to the Bill last Berger payment is 2020. And one more, yeah, one more year, this year and next. Fiscal year 2020. FY 2020. Okay. And this is only the second time that we've had to come here for the pre-approval, the Phillies, and then this one. Yes, and for two different reasons: the Phillies on a separate track because of the nature of the the request, and this is on a separate track because of the. Uh, uh, 10 million excess of 10 million dollar request okay under the guidelines 
And my last question, Madam Chair, is when are we having that big discussion about bed tax, potential uses, and all the other things you mentioned, transit, infrastructure, um, arts? That's something that Mr. Burt and I have been discussing. Over well, I think there's there's two discussions there because one you've asked for a, a joint meeting with the TTC, um, and then the other piece being um, all of our other capital uh, type items. So we're we're looking at that. We haven't scheduled a fixed date on that yet. Still waiting on some additional information, especially on the transportation piece. Okay, so you're talking months or In the next summer months. or so? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Which has been pushed back somewhat. Um, and so, as I've indicated before, what my intent is that we'll have the county commission look at all the transportation needs and monies available, have that discussion, then I'll bring it to the TDC, and then we'll have a joint workshop between the county commission and the TDC, depending on the outcomes and questions and all of that. Okay. Thank you. So we'll, we'll keep you apprised of the schedule. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I am disappointed that when we started this conversation, it is taking this long for us to get it on the calendar. And if we're not careful, we're going to end up in the midst of summer when everybody's away, nobody can come together, and it's going to be another excuse to delay, delay, delay. So I, um, I'm, I'm happy to move this forward for the work of the due diligence of the TDC to be done, but I do want to have that conversation before we start actually allocating dollars. And I, that's my intention. As I've said before, I plan to come back once we know all the ask and we know what the dollars we have and to have a very robust discussion about how we want to allocate that. We still, you know, are uncertain about the raise and so that's another whole unknown in this whole quotient. So I really do want to make sure that we are addressing all of it. Well, not may just one portion of it because I think that would not be wise deliberation. Well, I have another question if I might. So are all of our decisions going to be put on the back burner waiting for the Rays to decide what they're going to do? It's been, I mean, do we have any idea at this point? We don't. We're scheduled to meet with Mayor Kreisman, Mr. Burton, and I very soon. And um, so we... So, so the question on the meeting with the TDC, you can have that discussion. The question is, what, what, what components are you ready to discuss? Um, and you know some of the conversations we've had and the information that we've, we've been seeking. I've kept you apprised of, of some of that. Um, how fruitful of discussion. If you want to talk about the projects, we can have that at any time. We know what the projects are. The, the meat and, and some of the detail behind the projects and where they're going with them, we don't at this point. So. Um, I can certainly work with the chair and, and confine that to a certain piece, but uh, there are certain things that, for information that we're, we're, we're waiting for at this point. Uh, Commissioner Justice was next, and then Commissioner Eggers. Since we're throwing potential things in the mix of discussion and, and uh, TDC, uh, I would just throw on the list to keep on our radar to have a more uh, thoughtful discussion about the idea of the sports park that we talked about briefly a few months ago as far as kind of determining our own future with uh, capital expenditures with facilities and not just funding everybody else's facilities but having Great. some control of our own um, especially if the race is not going to the race stadium is not going to happen I agree with that a thousand percent and I don't understand why we can't have those conversations instead of waiting for everything else to come to the table I mean we could wait for another year or two <clears throat> well, we can put a deadline on it ourselves. Um, you know, my suggestion is that I would think we should have till the end of this year to know maybe one way or the other. Um, and um, so that's kind of what I would impose as kind of a deadline is that by the end of this 
December of 2018. We'll have the sports complex report, I'm sure, done. Correct, Tim? Yes, and then That's um, on the TDC agenda for this next that? month. The t that's on the TDC agenda for them to begin discussing. Discussing it. And just thank you, Madam Chair. One more point was that when we set out with the last round, when we did the big round with the aquarium and the Blue Jays and everybody else, we loaded those up in a short period of time mm -hmm. to where those would all be paid off in just a few years in order if <coughs> it was the board's decision to move forward with Rays, helping the Rays in St. Pete, that there'd be plenty of time. Because even if they decided today on the location, that's going to take several years of construction. And, right. and again, we don't have to be the first 10 million or 100 million. We can be the last 10 million. Uh, Commissioner Eggers and then Commissioner Welch. Uh, Commissioner Justice touched on it a little bit, and that is that um, we're talking about trying to get some handle on that transportation ask or transit ask, and there will be other sources of funds that we need to look at also. But, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm still not clear in that fund um, what, the, what the state has opened it up for use. In other words, are there other things that the staff has identified that have the nexus with tourism? Uh, it, in a connection that, you know, as tourism rises, so do the so do the demands on our system. And I know that there's, you know, for instance, the EMS system. We know that it really rises up during the tourist season. Now, there's a nexus there. Do we are there other sources, uh, other departments, excuse me, that have identified areas for reimbursement of expenses due to the nexus with tourism? Um, and it, it, has that been opened up by the? The st you know the areas that the state has opened up. I just want to make sure that we're considering all things that might be candidates for TDC funds, based on what the state has allowed us to do, and as this, as as our staff looked at that. Um, yes, Michael Zoss has looked at it. Um, we'll resend you the memo that outlines um, the entire process as well as the eligible categories. Um, is pretty well defined under the state statute. Um, it also can, Michael, do you want to maybe, I see you, so I'm going to put you <laughs> on the spot and <laughs> right ask you to come up and answer that. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Mr. And it Mr. also, Sir. don't forget, the Tourist Development Council would have to approve any study to see if it meets the nexus for being eligible for um, tourism. And before Michael even jumps in, I'll, I'll add a, a, a very important first step would be modifying the tourist development plan. Plan. Correct. Correct. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, Michael Azos, County Attorney's Office. Uh, one point of clarification is the state statute that does allow for some of the public facility use of these dollars, including transportation facilities, sewer facilities, and that such. Um, the nexus that is required is that it is direct correlation in regards to a need to uh, increase tourist business activities. So it's not just as a result of increased tourism, but that it's going to generate more tourism in and of itself. That's something that I think we need to kind of keep mindful of that because it's not just a, okay, if there's impacts, we can pay for it necessarily. And as Jewel correctly pointed out, the tourist development plan would have to be modified. That's something that's certainly within your province to do to recognize those additional uses as well as there will have to be a study for each and one of these, each one of these requests to establish that nexus before you can use the dollars. So I hope that clarifies it. And So it is a reimbursement piece, but also a, a, what it might generate additional additional terms. So it's not just one. Well, let me emphasize yeah. it. Can, it's capital. It's capital. capital it's right. capital. No operations and maintenance. Right. So it really could not, in my opinion, be used for EMS operations, et cetera. Well, the, again, the, ne the, the key is the nexus between does it increase tourist business activities, not is it a need because we have more increased tourism to offset those costs. There was a limited exception for some smaller counties that were able to tap into some of these dollars for, excuse me, for those kind of services, Commissioner Eggers, yeah. like EMS, but that was very limited in for those particular counties. Okay. I believe it population. was um, Fort Walton Beach and the correct. Panhandle and somewhere area. in the Panhandle, correct. Yeah. It was a population-driven mm -hmm. sort of. Okay, thank you. Okay. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. And that's, you know, going to be a deep conversation, yes. and we've all got questions based on what you just <laughs> said, um, because I, I know sewer was a popular topic when this was being discussed, and I'm trying to understand how sewer can increase 
tourism unless it gives you the capacity to have more tourists in. But So that's going to be the deep kind of conversation we need to have, and I agree with your approach, Madam Chair. I think we need to have all the information. Um, so far we talked about transportation, the sports complex, the arts, infrastructure, all those things, and we really need a, a strategic approach to what we're going to do with that bed tax. It, it can't solve every problem, and so I, I, I agree with your timeline that you laid out for doing that. And then besides that is the transportation discussion, gas tax, penny, TIF. That's another conversation that, you know, aligns with this. So, you know, I, I support your approach, and I think we need to have that broad discussion. I think the raise issue is moving forward. And, again, we need to keep that in mind. Hillsborough is basically off the table, as we know. So I, it's a lot for us to think about, but it's really all good things for us to have have to discuss. We've got a great revenue source and a lot of great projects. How do we line that up for the next decade or so? So thank you. And I do want to mention, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, and one thing just to, to play on to Commissioner Walsh's comments, keep in mind the legislature is meeting in Tallahassee right now, and there could be some pretty stark limitations uh, imposed on the uses of those funds directly related to some of the projects you've discussed here today. Well, in relationship to that, do you know of specific things that are moving forward? Um, we can certainly try to get an update. I can't tell you right now off the top of my head, but the biggest conversation in Tallahassee has been putting a limitation on baseball. Mm. Stadiums, right. public right. stadiums, for private stadiums. For both for spring facilities and spring training. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And if they're on government land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, very good. I appreciate the conversation. I assure you that I, Barry and I have not been trying to purposely delay anything. We just want you to have the best information and to be able to move forward in the most um, proactive and um, conservative, but yet um, you know, timely as, as we possibly can um, to make sure that we are watching these dollars carefully as well. Um, Barry and I are meeting tomorrow for the April 17th agenda review for the Tourist Development Council. Um, but we have moved ahead. We had our very first uh, budget committee meeting plus our marketing committee meeting for the Tourist Development Council. Both meetings were went very well. At the April 17th meeting, after the Tourist Development Council meeting, we are going to have a very, very robust discussion about um, our marketing and the return on the investment, et cetera. So um, we are following the protocols that I told you we were going to and trying to um, keep our arms wrapped around the real um, expenditures of the tourist bed taxes and making sure we have the proper um, investments. I mean, obviously, we're doing quite well because if anybody's driving our roads, it is um, probably a very um, stellar time again for our tourists visiting our area. So have patience. Okay. Um, we need a motion and a second. Do we have to vote on that? Commissioner Peters, I'm sorry. Do we have to vote on that? Yeah. That's what I was I trying to. Yeah, you had a motion and a second. We have a motion and a second. I think so. Aretha, did we have a motion? Yes. Yeah, I thought we, we did. did. Okay. Did we vote on it? No. no. Okay, if you could pull the voting cards, please. I'm sorry, it's still not coming up there, but yes. Okay, unanimous approval to move forward, and we will keep all of the comments in mind that you just made. Uh, agenda item 31. Item 31 is a service area competition grant award with the U.S. Department of Health and Human uh, Services um, for health care for the homeless uh, program uh, in the um, funding amount of $1,456,000. Move approval. Move second. <laughs> I'm sorry, who made the motion? Um, Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner Justice. Yes. Okay, unanimous approval. 
Agenda item 32. Item 32 is a resolution dedicating a portion of county owned property on Pine Street um, as a public right of way for the dance wear. This will allow for uh, the subject parcel will likely be sold or transferred. This enables a, um, uh, us to get rid of a strip of land that will allow more affordable housing to be built. So moved. Second. Sorry, is it Commissioner Welch? Okay, so motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Peters. Voting cards, please. Yes. Okay, unanimous approval. Agenda item 33. Item 33 is an interlocal agreement with the City of Tarpon Springs for the planning, engineering, design phases uh, for a dredging project. This will provide $300,000 on a reimbursement basis. Um, the city is in partnership with the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Uh, for this uh, particular project. Move approval. Second. Okay, um, motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. And um, I noticed that we all did get a letter about the additional request, and I'd like to request that we put that on a work session item. Okay. Um, to have more robust discussion about that. I had planned to put it in as a as an ask during the uh, our one decision one packet. Yeah. yeah, for next week. The ones that are due next week are decision packet. Yeah, because I wanted to further the discussion and com the conversation about this. So I want to make sure that we didn't lose sight of it. Now, I don't know when that workshop's going to happen, but. Yeah, we'll put it on a workshop. Um, well, this, would be part of, this would be part of, if it's a decision package, and it would be part of our budget process. Mm -hmm. um, so the, and, and I'm going to be going up and meeting with the city manager uh, to understand a little bit more about uh, the request and where it's at. And, the only thing I offer caution on this is that this, you know, we really need to be very careful because this could open up the door for a lot of projects um, where we're requested to assist for um, dredging. This particular project that we are approving today had history associated with it, and that is why we agreed to um, honor this request because and bring this request forward to your approval because. Um, there was history where we had helped with this before, and it was not new ground, literally. <laughs> so. There's no question that this dredging. I mean, again, we're talking, that's what we're talking about here, is specific to economic development and that, and that, and that. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that this, you cannot say that just because it's an economic development or a tourism generated need that it is the same as all dredging. It just isn't. Correct. And it's I'm just going to make this comment, though, that, you know, we have been approached before by Gulfport to do mooring buoys. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can make the argument for a lot of different projects around the county. And, you know, you, you, we just need to be very deliberate in our, Agreed. Um, Agreed. In our consideration. So. Anyone else? I just wanted to make the point that it is the only safe harbor on this side of the coast in a storm, and that that um, shipbuilding business up there relies on being able to get back and forth and out into the Gulf. Well, certainly we will bring all that information forward, but I would encourage, not encourage, I would ask that the staff, as we consider this, mention any other potential if we open this door what are the other potential projects that might come forward to us um, be because of doing something of this nature so i just i just want everybody to go in with their eyes wide open <laughs> so okay let's go ahead and vote i'm a yes i don't know where my little ballot went <laughs> okay, it's unanimous approval. Uh, agenda item 34. Item 34 is a joint funding agreement with U.S. Um, Geological, Geological Survey. Uh, this is for water uh, data, collect, uh, data collection program. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a citizen who would like to be heard on this agenda item. It's David Ballard Geddes. Have three minutes. Hi, good, good morning, Commissioners. David Ballard, get a Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm <coughs> Harbor. Um, being that reclaimed water, in my mind, is considered a pollution discharge, 
and that, that we consume the reclaimed water um, when the reclaimed water is irrigated and the vapors that we smell, um, we're actually consuming reclaimed water um, and the highly treated reclaimed water, again, as I've stated in the past, is not sanitized and it's not sterilized. I feel as though we should not uh, spray reclaimed water around in the air, um, nor should we directly inject reclaimed water directly into the aquifer. Um, reclaimed water is chlorinated uh, fecal uh, flow, and um, I feel that the SHARP program and the TAP program, the South Hillsboro uh, Aquifer Recharge Program and the, the Tampa Augmentation Program is a nefarious operation. Um, furthermore, the Department of Interior needs to know that the reclaimed water variance application, again, clearly states that the applicant literally owes their health and safety and that reclaimed water is more than noxious. In my mind, this is a dangerous uh, um, proposal, um, and as well as the variance application in Statute 15303, Section 5, is claimed as an uh, eminent domain of the applicant's property. I feel as a, a uh, um, uh, we, what the county should be doing at this point in time is establishing dry beds throughout the county splash beds where we can pump reclaimed water, excess storm water, uh, strategically placed um, areas throughout the town where the water can aerobically and naturally filter its way through the ground um, the way God intended it to, to replenish our aquifer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any comments, questions? Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Welch. Have the voting cards. Okay, it passes unanimously with those present. Agenda item 35. Agenda item 35 is a change order number one with KAT construction for the McKay Creek Reclaim Water Pump Station Valve Improvement Program. This increases the contract amount by $156,000 and by 60 consecutive calendar days. Move approval. Second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Welch. Any questions? All right, well, we'll go ahead and open up the voting cards, please. Um, passes unanimously by those present. Uh, agenda item 36, County Administrator Miscellaneous. So I have a few items uh, to talk about today. Uh, the first is that, um, as we've discussed in the past, regarding the Lelman community, um, we are elevating a, a key position in this area to really focus on the needs of the, the 36,000 residents and the unincorporated Lelman community. In, in our new role, uh, so Chris Moore's here, if you stand, Chris, he is being elevated to be an assistant to the county administrator. And we're really trying to put some emphasis on um, uh, collaboration and um, and energy to into his new role to really bring people together to try to get make bigger things happen we're doing a lot but not necessarily in a coordinated focused manner to try to get private investment to try to get energy in the community manage the 11 million dollar facility that you invested in uh, to have a go-to person uh, that really can bring the resources of all the county government to bear to make things happen in the Loma community so we're very excited that Chris um, uh, took on this challenge in his new role. Um, he will coordinate the CRA programs, local services, and the activities of the community center. And again, I just um, wanted to, to start off by kicking that off and congratulate Chris and thank him for taking on that new role. Congratulations. Okay. Congratulations. We look forward to um, all of the good work that you'll do, and I know that you've already started working in that area. Um, Commissioner Justice has posted a few of the photos and goings on down in Loman. Thank you. Should I say something? Yes. If you, thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to thank the administrator for uh, making this a priority. Uh, this is something that several of us have talked about for a lot of years, as uh, in Lelman and the unincorporated in general. So, uh, and uh, I think Chris is the right person, and we're looking forward to great things. So, I appreciate it. Good. Good luck. Yeah, I, I too wanted to thank the administrator for moving in this direction because I think there are areas in the Pinellas community or, or unincorporated area uh, that do need that help, that do need a person to pull 
uh, groups together to get projects done. And I don't, I don't want to say it's like a city manager, but it's somebody who does work in area that has ultimate kind of responsibility in day-to-day -day things and reports directly to Barry. And I think that's a, that'll be a, a marked improvement, and I look forward to uh, additional expansion of that thought process. And on that same, on that same uh, note, by creating this position and having the structure in place, we're going to apply that to an additional repurposed position within county government focusing on the north area. That'll be advertised internally. We're going to try to make this a part time, and we'll and we'll evaluate it as it goes. So we're using a lot, utilizing the resources internally first, and then evaluate that to see if it needs if it needs expansion. Okay. Let's not forget Ridgecrest and High Point. <laughs> We've yes. got to cover. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Gerard. Um, the second um, announcement that I'd like to, to um, make is I'm, it's my pleasure to uh, announce that I'm appointing Gay Lancaster, whom you all know very, very well, um, as I, the permanent director of the contractor and licensing department. Um, hey. we, she decided she wanted to stick around and this time finish what she started, okay? Um, and um, so we're, we're looking, obviously, she's taking a comprehensive review of all the policies and procedures um, and really ensuring that we have an accountable, transparent, <coughs> and functioning organization. And she said she needs some time to do that and make sure and she wants to finish what she started. So um, we're thrilled that she's taken on that, uh, that role. And, and, but we're also <coughs> going to repurpose a position and make it a deputy director to where we make sure we have con business continuity um, and, and in case she does decide to go back to re and retired one day, we're well positioned to be able to have a smooth <coughs> um, and seamless transition. Um, so we're real, real happy Gay's um, taking that on and, and, and want to thank her for that. Um, thank you, Gay. <laughs> Again. Welcome back. In, in that same area, one of the areas that we are looking at how do we do business better is we're going to take on a pilot program um, with our contractor and licensing department and our building and code enforcement department to say how can we integrate services. So to, to be an inspector for the contractor and licensing, you have to be a building inspector. Well, we have building inspectors, and why should we have one person going out to this place and a different building inspector going out to the place next door for a permit issue? And so we're going to be taking it and setting up a pilot area and integrating these services and using that as a way for us to evaluate the effectiveness of it and how we can reduce downtime, drive time, and be more efficient in the way we deliver service. So in part, we're going to ask her and our building department to work together to collaborate and, and work to make sure we can integrate these services as much as, po as possible. I think it can all be done, but we're going to start with a pilot. We're going to learn from it and then hope to expand and grow that, you know, in the way we deliver service. That sounds exciting. Agreed. And yes, Commissioner Welch. Well, uh, welcome back, Gay. I wonder why you're here today. Um, and Barry, I can think of a better person to move forward. My question is on, I think it was <coughs> Sellers, the software that we're implementing. What's the status of that? Um, we've added, and, um, we've added them to the part of that implementation now. So that'll be a key component, um, and so you'll you'll see it as a budget modification later. But, but there's an implementation time period, and that's really out. what I'm asking: how long before they actually have those tools in the department? Is it a year out? Is it Pro probably? But I would defer. It's pr probably about that timeline. They haven't even started the implementation on the other areas yet. Okay. So we're we're putting about four hundred thousand dollars, a little over that, into her area. We've also given her some additional resources. She's okay. she's got boxes of information that needs to be scanned and put into the system to where it's efficient. So that's part of that upfront cost we need to get the, the place functioning well and what she really wanted to take on and make sure she fixed this time. So that's all part of that implementation to get the place up and running. Thank you. Great. And the final thing that I wanted to announce is we've heard a lot about the use of glyphosate and the exposures and concerns relating regarding how we use that on public lands. Well, I've asked Jennifer Bramley, the city manager in Deneen, to partner with me to uh, co-chair a, a um, task force that will work with the, and we're going to invite all the cities to participate, to come up with a model program that we can use uh, to be consistent in how we uh, work 
uh, the, these issues on public lands. So I'm happy she's agreed to co-chair it with me. We'll get our staffs involved, or the technical working um, knowledge, and, and come back with kind of a model program that then each community can look at, decide to adopt, um, you know, not adopt. It's, it's certainly their individual choice. But, you know, we've got certain communities that have taken on some pieces, other communities that haven't. Rather than duplicate efforts, we've decided to come together and uh, <coughs> come up with a program together. So I'll be reporting back as that group meets and has ideas and recommendations. That's wonderful. That's exactly the kind of partnerships that we like to see here in the county is to look at this on a broad perspective so that we're um, doing things in a... In comprehensive way and the same way if we were able to. <laughs> I think that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Chair, um, I think there is interest in the county uh, putting something together and putting something forward and maybe uh, allowing groups to opt out of something, but I, I think there was some real interest from the mayors to do something countywide on this issue because it, they're so close <laughs> to each other, all, the, all of our cities and everything in our unincorporated areas so close to each other that it makes total sense to be looking at this at least together, and then figuring out where we go from there. But uh, I'm glad uh, glad you got one of the one of the cities I think that really is interested in looking. This Safety Harbors looked at this. I'm sure many of the cities have mm -hmm. uh, already. So good, good stuff. It also deals with stormwater runoff that takes any anything that we're applying pesticide wise or otherwise, and making sure we have the best management practices possible. Commissioner Welch, I, I concur with. Um, Commissioner Eggers on this. Can you tell us a little bit about the timeline and what the range of outcomes might be? Um, the timeline is I rolled it out at our city manager's um, working uh, luncheon last Friday um, and, and told them following this meeting I'd be sending an email out inviting them to participate. So we don't have a date for the first meeting yet. I was going to propose some dates and then we would get that first meeting going. Um, I think it, it it's going to be where they want to take it. If, if uh, there's obviously some people that have already kind of come to um, best management practices, mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to look at those and, and tweak from those uh, where we want to go. And, and I think getting the input of several different people. I don't know if there's going to be a lot of um, um, different ideas in terms of what a model ordinance would be. Um, so, um, but I wouldn't think this is something that would take more than you know the summer to complete. Okay, and you're looking at the science of the issue. The science of the issue, the, the practice, uh, you know, I mean, you know, we, we have issues about when you get close to waterways um, versus other land management practices. And so each of those will come in. I'm going to be learning, you know, more about this as part of this process. And so I think getting the, 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 the folks that have, that have been dealing with this and, and learning from each other will be part of that process. So I don't necessarily have a predicted outcome uh, as a result at this point. Very well, I didn't want to predict. I'm sorry, I didn't want a prediction. But I'm just the range. Could it be that we're not using that product anymore, or we're using it in a different way? You're looking at the science and the safety aspects, or any new information is. I, I think it's really the practices. How how and when do you use certain types of herbicides or pesticides? Um, and and that's the. Uh, that's the part that where you know is there distances that are safe are there areas where it's 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 um, um, okay and the science supports that or is in these areas it's never okay and those are the types of things that I hope to learn and, and kind of you know bring together into some kind of a policy yeah from just from my comfort level I'd really like to know you know what the best you know, science is saying today about that product and if it is something that's more expensive, if it's shown that it's not safe, that we're going to move away from it. But if right. the science says it is safe in these conditions, you know, I just want to make sure we're looking at the entire spectrum. And, and you're exactly right. There, there is no question that it, the other products are more expensive and, and less effective. And the question is, goes back to the health and safety concerns. And in that particular, it doesn't matter what the cost is. And so that's what we hope to learn from. Our technical Thank experts. you for putting that together. Thank you. And I, I was going to say somewhat the same thing, just that cost benefit is really important, what the benefit that we're going to gain from this um, and what it is and what the trade-off is because there's some direct issues that we may have to forego 
if we go in a certain direction that we've been working on for so long. And that's fine if we decide to do that. But so that's that, I think that's going to be real important, and obviously the process. And so appreciate appreciate that uh, leadership. And that concludes my report. Okay. All excellent progress. We thank you. Um, this is just a small snapshot of what's being done by Mr. Burton, and um, I know I'm being apprised on a regular basis, and I'm sure you are too. Um, we're, we're moving along and making some good progress, so thank you. Next is County Attorney, agenda item 37. Under item number 37, I recommend the board approve staff's recommendation on the proposed settlement as <coughs> outlined in the confidential memorandum of today's date. Move approval. Second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Welch and second by Commissioner uh, Gerard. The voting, thank you. Yes. Okay, a unanimous thank you. Uh, agenda item 38. Um, also on 38, I recommend the board approve staff's recommendation on the proposed settlement as outlined in the confidential memorandum of today's date. Move approval. Second. A uh, motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by uh, Commissioner Welch. Okay, unanimous decision. Thank you. Um, anything else, County Attorney? Yes, Attorneys? I would like to introduce to the board the newest attorney on our staff, uh, Dariki Gayuka. He joined our staff about three weeks ago now. Uh, we have him hard at work already. He is working with our Parks Department, Code Enforcement, Human Rights, Office of Human Rights with Paul Valente, and also with our Purchasing Department, uh, among other duties. Um, I shared with Commissioner Welch that he is a graduate of Florida A&M. <laughs> One of the highest I saw Got that. Got the too. right pen on. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I know that those of you here know that I am a, a Gator, but my last hire was from Florida State, and Dariki comes from Florida A&M and also a graduate of Stetson Law. Uh, so we do, we are very fair in our hiring practices uh, in the county attorney's office. Yeah, we, we do. do. We do. Um, Dariki came to us uh, from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta where he spent a year as a law clerk. Excellent. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Thank Welcome. you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And in keeping with being hard at work, we're probably going to send him right back upstairs to <laughs> continue on with some assignments I know that he has that are very pressing. Well, welcome to Pinellas County Government and to the County Attorney's Office. I had the pleasure to meet you at the ethics training, so um, welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Good to Great. see you. Okay. Congratulations. Great. Thank Congratulations. You. <laughs> Agenda item 40, County Administrator Reports, the North Pinellas Trail Loop Update. Yes, we have um, we have two items for in under citizens' the, value. The reports, yes. We, the first item being the North um, Pinellas Trail update. Um, I did provide um, a brief discussion um, at committee on that. I would ask Ken Jacobs to come forward. I kind of outlined the history of this prior program, and in particular some of the concerns that were raised um, with regarding this trail section. Good morning again, uh, Ken Jacobs, Pinellas County Transportation. Uh, I wanted to go over a, a little update for the for the North Loop segment. Um, uh, in, in this uh, obviously started many many years ago. In in 1987 is when they did the feasibility study for the Trail Loop. Um, the Trail Loop kind of uh, uh, focused on the the west side along a, an abandoned railroad corridor. Uh, so there, there was really two key things that, that came out of that. One, the loop was meant to be the backbone for the entire county. So other smaller cities uh, and, and municipalities, as they uh, built their own uh, trails internal to their cities, they could hook into that loop, which would give them connectivity throughout the county. Uh, the abandoned uh, railroad corridor, as well as the, the Duke Energy easements, uh, were a focus to keep uh, the a separation between uh, the, the vehicles and the pedestrians and bikes as much as possible. Uh, that's not always feasible. Uh, we do have some, some segments of the trail that run along uh, county right-of-way, uh, roadway right-of-way, uh, but when we, have a, when we have the opportunity, we move to uh, a segment of road right away that that doesn't have vehicle traffic. 
1999, the county signed uh, an agreement with Florida Power to use the power trail. In 2016, we re-signed that agreement. And then in uh, 2009, the last segment was uh, uh, funded by the FDOT, which was a pedestrian overpass across US-19 at Enterprise. So the, the top of our existing trail, if you look at the map, you'll see the, the small red line is the gap that we have. Uh, what we talked about this morning was that uh, small uh, other gap on the north end. That'll be closed. That'll leave just the, uh, the one large gap on the north end. Uh, that'll connect John Chestnut Park on the north end to the uh, Enterprise Overpass on the south end. And that will utilize, uh, was uh, meant to go down the uh, Duke Energy easement. Uh, in 2009, when that was uh, completed, was about the time uh, that we ran into a recession and we ran into funding issues. So uh, what we tried to do over the next several years was, was find funding for the trail. Uh, obviously, you see by this slide, uh, we, were, we were relatively unsuccessful with our target grants for several years in a row. Uh, however, in 16, the, D, uh, the state uh, funded what they call the Sun Trail Fund, and we applied for that in 2017 and received a $5.7 million uh, grant allocation from the Sun Trail program. Um, part of the uh, us uh, getting approved for that was that uh, we had a trail plan in place. It was ready to go. We could move forward with it at a fast pace and uh, it was one of the first allocations with the Sun Trail money, so they wanted to make sure that we could expedite the process. As part of us taking on that is, is, uh, was our effort to uh, expedite it by going through what we call a design-build contractor instead of a, uh, a longer period design, then bid, then go to contract. So uh, this is our first design-build uh, transportation project that we have. Um, over the last, uh, when, we, when we got to a point in the design, we, we went out to uh, several public meetings. Uh, I think we had about six of them. Uh, we garnered input from the public. Uh, what concerns were documented, we, we got back with our designer. Where we could make changes, we did make changes. Uh, and generally, uh, anecdotally, from the staff that was present at the meetings, uh, there was generally favorable comments on, on, the, on the project itself. Um, we even went as far as there was a couple uh, homeowners associations that have had issues, and so we actually met them out in the field and actually walked the project. Uh, it gave them a much better understanding of what it's going to look like in that area. And uh, so uh, overall, I think that was, that was very beneficial. Um, this is basically the proposed alignment. Uh, so on the south end, it starts at Enterprise. It goes up the, the Duke Energy easement all the way up until you get to, uh, uh, let's see if I can do a mouse here, until you get right here, which is uh, Meadowwood Drive. It goes jogs over to Countryside up and then uh, goes across at Tampa Road here and then goes up and connects to the John Chestnut Park at the north end. Uh, there has recently been discussion about uh, maybe McMullen Booth would have been a better route for uh, the trail. Uh, again, one of the things that we're, we try and do is, is separate uh, the vehicles as much as we can from the uh, pedestrian and bikes. Uh, McMullen Booth was eliminated early on when they were doing alternatives because of uh, safety issues, and that really revolves around uh, conflict points. Uh, we did go back out recently just to review those conflict points because they probably changed over time. Uh, there was 48 uh, conflict points, which is basically driveways and intersections where a vehicle could be in conflict with a pedestrian or bike. Uh, that's in, McMullen Booth. That's on McMullen Booth. Uh, along the trail uh, alignment that we currently use, there's, uh, that we currently recommend, there's 23. Uh, there's also a significant difference between 
uh, the, the high-speed drivers on McMullen Booth that might be slowing down to make a right turn into a driveway versus uh, traffic on Countryside Boulevard, which is uh, 35 miles an hour. It's uh, low volume, so it gives the, uh, the pedestrian bike is, is more prevalent in the landscape. Um, the next steps in the project, um, as I mentioned, it's a design-build project, and the way the, the uh, contract is structured is uh, the contractor uh, has spent uh, the last uh, nine months or so doing a design. It's up to the 60% level, and then they close out that first part of the contract by giving us a guaranteed maximum price that they'll go ahead, finish the design, and do the construction of the project. And that's where we're at right now. So their 60% design is done. Uh, they have developed the maximum, uh, guaranteed maximum price. So the next step is we come back to the board and we uh, provide the information relative to the guaranteed maximum price. If that becomes acceptable to the board, then we would go ahead and give the uh, contractor notice to proceed. Uh, he's already ready to go so he could start construction on the easiest parts of the, of the project, uh, probably somewhere around June of 19. So um, it says May, but uh, I think we're slipping already. So uh, you will see us come back in the next several months, uh, fairly shortly to, to provide that information to you. Uh, if you dis determine that the price was not uh, acceptable or you didn't want to move forward with it, that would terminate the contract with the design builder. Uh, we would take all that information they supplied us, and then we would have to move in a different direction. Uh, just an overall view, uh, we do have a project website. Uh, it gives you a, a where we're at with the project, the de uh, development process. Uh, there's an extensive uh, group of uh, frequently asked questions that you can go through. So. If anybody asks you, you can certainly provide them this information. And with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Mr. Eggers. Yeah. Um, thanks for the uh, for the update. Um, when you were looking at the project uh, and, the, and these public meetings, I assume they they, they started last year. Is that correct? The yeah. uh, first one was uh, November 18. Although we did have a uh, a meeting in January of 2017. Uh, at a general homeowners association meeting in Countryside where we did talk about the trail alignment. And you were, get, and you were doing kind of a general presentation yes. on where we are, yes. and you got input from the residents generally? Uh, in 17, we didn't get any comments back, mm -hmm. uh, neither positive nor negative, but it was part of the presentation. Uh, in 18, uh, November 18, we had a, a very large public uh, information meeting. There was about 150 people that, that were there. And we did garner about 22 comments from that uh, meeting. Uh, so for the most part, they were very specific. Uh, how does that work at my driveway? Uh, what's the drainage going to look like? Where is it located relative to my fence line? Uh, each one of those was reviewed and, and looked at to see if uh, there was a way to modify the plans to uh, either uh, make it work better for their specific comment or uh, as I mentioned before uh, we uh, we uh, provided uh, homeowners associations to have us come out and actually walk the property and uh, so they could actually see how it was going to look. And one of the things you mentioned was it, it kind of focusing away from McMullen Booth and probably mm -hmm. away from Countryside or Landmark was the number of interactions. <laughs> Whether they be homes or streets or or, or whatever, Correct. so we're looking at at the other way. But it also strikes me, and we had that conversation on Thursday at our, our pre-board meeting, that um, that the safety about getting across 580, um, potentially across Countryside Boulevard, because again, Countryside Boulevard, that location, if you get down there, it's kind of near a curve as you kind of come around the curve, so. I mean, those are the two mid-block crossings on at least five lanes of traffic. Mm -hmm. I think 580 is probably more like seven lanes when you total up all the 
the turning and everything. Um, so that concerns me as, as we're looking at this project and the project cost, which, listen, if we're going to talk safety, then we need to talk safety. And those are huge. You talk about interaction points with fast driving traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I did see the secretary the other day and, ex and expressed my concern about uh, 580. And he said, I, I get it, and I'm going to get back. When I get back to the office, we'll be looking at that. But I didn't really talk about Countryside Boulevard, which is another area. Mm -hmm. I think at Curlew, it's obviously, it's, I think the traffic numbers are close to 35 to 40,000, just like 580. But at least there you're at an, at an, inter, at an intersection with a light mm -hmm. uh, as, as you are it, when you get down to, um, I think it's uh, Enterprise, you could bring it over right. to a light I mean, instead of making it a mid-block crossing. Right. But it, again, it's another, uh, that and Countryside, I think that location was around 13,000, the average, average daily traffic count. Enterprise was, or excuse me, Countryside was about 26. Mm -hmm. And then you're up to almost 40,000 at, at 580 Five. in Curlew. So there are a little bit different situations, but I just, you know, you talk about interaction with, with folks at high traffic speeds and then getting people across 580. So to me, that project is not designed complete unless we look at those critical safety factors, uh, safety interactions. So, um, and I know it's cost, it's big money to get across 580 and then you're gonna bring them down and if you had to get them across countryside, that's another uh, big cost. So those things to me are critically important and, and every bit as important as the, 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 the concerns you have about going down McMullen Booth. And I'm not saying I'm one, you know, for that. I'm just saying those things have to be taken care of, in my Absolutely. opinion. So, uh, we, we understand that. The, the primary goal, based on the amount of money that we had available to us, was, was to finish the loop. Uh, however, the, the design consultant started off uh, showing us where uh, pedestrian overpasses would probably be recommended. Uh, 580 is one of them. Uh, however, there is a limitation because it is on the uh, uh, power easement, uh, the the poles would uh, possibly prohibit uh, a pedestrian overpass there. I think it's something we can work around. However, uh, with each one of the overpasses costing between three and five million dollars, uh, for us to be able to implement and, and complete the loop, uh, we wanted to go ahead and get that on the ground first. Uh, we certainly know and understand that there's several locations, uh, including existing locations, where pedestrian overpasses are critical. Uh, <laughs> Stair Road 60 and, and, and Coachman is, is a good example. It's been there forever. Uh, relative to 580, uh, the recommendation is for a full mid-block pedestrian signal there, so it will have <coughs> uh, as, as much uh, safety as, as the signal does provide. Um, countryside will also have a signal. And, uh, uh, and then Curlew already has the signal, and then Tampa Road, we're crossing at the signal. Countryside trip. will, I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. Countryside will have a signal uh, crossing Countryside. Mid-block crossing. Uh, it actually is at a minor intersection across from one of the driveways. So. Not a light. <coughs> it will have a traffic signal. It will have a light, okay, a light. that you'll be in, but no, okay. And then, um, but just, just for that, for I, I understand what you're saying. Um, we built the, the one over 19. Mm -hmm. There was nothing on either side of it. So we built that first right. to make sure that when we did do the rest of it, that we had that all taken care of. Absolutely. Instead of doing it the other way and saying, okay, now take a, take a chance and cross 19. Mm -hmm. So I know these are not quite as dramatic as mm -hmm. 19, but uh, to me, they're, uh, yeah. 580 is uh, very, uh, very yes. scary. Internally, so. one of the things that we've been talking about is, is going over all the crossings that we do have left that are at grade that we believe uh, are potentials for uh, pedestrian overpasses and prioritizing those so we can work with the FDOT uh, and the board uh, to come up with a, a plan moving forward to uh, uh, install those where we where we find them yeah. to be absolutely and, and, and and The last comment I would make is just that uh, whenever we do implement something like this, mm -hmm. I think we're trying, we're in effect giving some assurances to our residents that we think it's safe. And I, I think that needs to be something in the back of our mind, the front of our mind completely when we finish this, that 
we truly in our hearts think that uh, if we had a, a, a grandparent that was in a wheelchair that wanted to get across or, you know, that kind of thing, that we actually can put that stamp of safety mm -hmm. approval on it. So um, anyway, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Any other? We have some citizens who wish to be heard. Thank you, Ken. Stay um, close by, please. Um, first is Jerry um, Krantz. Hello. I'm Jerry Krantz. Uh, my address is 1937 Rebecca Drive. I'm the property manager for, <clears throat> excuse me, Chateau Woods Condominium Complex. It's on the uh, Metalwood Street. And um, I did appreciate Mr. Uh, Egger's comments on safety, especially 580. That really hit a nerve with me that there's such a, a they want to get this project done so quickly so you can say I got a loop. And probably 99.9% .9 of the people will never do the loop, okay? So it seems a little ridiculous, you know, to complete a loop so you can say you got a loop. And with that, I was a bit appalled when the gentleman that was just up here said that they wanted to get that loop complete. And as you said, um, not consider 580 or Countryside Boulevard first, the safety. And I'll say this just quickly, that uh, last Saturday I was on um, down in Dunedin uh, where the trail is. And it's pretty busy there. And I was crossing it, going pretty slow, paying attention luckily, okay? Because if you're not paying attention at those crosswalks, a lot of those people crossing aren't paying attention. And so I'm coming up to it and here comes some bicycles they didn't bother to stop to push the button. They went right in front of me. I had to hit the brakes. Luckily, I was paying attention, so it wasn't a big deal. But that just goes to show you the dangers, especially 580. They can be doing 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. And if they're not paying attention or the people crossing aren't paying attention, it definitely needs a crosswalk. Now, the other thing, because I only got a minute, is for years we were told that um, the, the Duke Energy tri um, line would be used, okay? And we've always known that. We've known it was put off. Um, then all of a sudden in November of last year, we were told that, no, it's going to go down Meadowood as a shock to everybody in the neighborhood and adjoining neighborhoods. And, you know, we're the ones that had to ask for these meetings, okay, um, and get these done. And they listened. But we could tell that they were just on a mission to get this loop done, you know. They said that they would need to acquire land. Fine. They've never made an attempt to do that. They just said, oh, we'll make this turn. Go down Countryside Boulevard so we can get our loop done. No. They should look into acquiring the land, and that would be much safer going up that, that corridor uh, where, the, where the lines are. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Bruce Rumble. Hi. Good morning. Uh, I'm here to kind of, uh, for many different reasons, uh, I can refute uh, some of the statements that Mr. Jacobs said uh, about being 48. Um, they quoted it as driveways, it's not driveways, it's streets. And um, with that said, I did a count on it, which anybody can do via Google Maps on a computer or ride it yourself, which I did both. And as far as the count on the route that I proposed last time that we were up here. Hey, Pete, uh, Pete can you show the map that's on here? And turn it so that it as you were looking at it. Okay, and that's, that's what I would... Okay. okay. Is that how you want to show it? Yes, basically, okay. yes. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So the proposed um, route is in red here for the north <clears throat> loop, 
And uh, my proposal to come down Enterprise Road saves uh, two lights this way, which would save a million dollars first off in cost. And as you come down McMullen Booth Road here, there's basically um, 22 driveway, or Wilcom Street's the right name, and on Enterprise there's eight. Uh, so it comes out to basically 30 as a total. Um, 23 on the proposed in red, and uh, six lights on my proposal here in the eight orange, and there's five lights with the two new lights, which is a million dollars. So um, part of my statement, uh, you're worried about traffic on McMullen Booth Road and interaction with people, traffic. Well, if you're worried about that, why do we have a trail alongside um, north of John Cheslin Park that goes right alongside East Lake Road, McMullen Booth, East Lake Road, same thing. Um, and up there after uh, John Chestnut, uh, there's 19 driveways and two lights. And the, and the speed limit up there is 50 mile an hour. Speed limit on McMullen Booth is 45 mile an hour and uh, Enterprise 35. So, you know, it, I'm just saying we have to use some common sense here and some correct figures. It, and I am worried about safety, first and foremost, just like you all are too. And I'm also concerned about when you run down the uh, Duke Energy Trail, you are underneath power lines that are emitting EMFs. Um, like I've said before to y'all, that I, I truly believe that that is an issue that's going to become uh, more worldwide known as time goes on, just like, like I said before with the Big Tobacco said, oh, well, shoot, smoking's okay. This doesn't cause cancer. EMS don't cause cancer, right? And they're finding out that it does. So that's where I'm going with this, and uh, I just hope that y'all will use some common sense and understand that you know, not all these figures and facts that you're getting are totally correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Scott Bressler, and um, Ruth Strum has yielded her time to Scott. Um, so, Scott, you'll have six minutes total. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Commissioner Eggers for meeting with me a few weeks back, a couple weeks back, for 45 minutes, and Mr. Burton's email. Um, really appreciate the time they took in, in doing so. Um, we're all here, quite frankly, because we feel safety is a major concern, as you do. Um, we're also concerned about getting the most for the taxpayer dollar, penny for Pinellas, wherever the money's coming from. We want to maximize that, but also have a safe route that's effective in all areas possible. Um, there were several areas in Mr. Burton's uh, email that I wanted to bring up, um, one of which he addressed some of the meetings in the past year and a half or so. Um, to the best of my recollection, the, the board had already approved the project, and those meetings were basically to announce what had been approved. How about having meetings and announcements to citizens and homeowners in the area before and getting their input and suggestions? How about also getting the suggestions and input from law enforcement? I've never heard any mention that that was involved. Um, because law enforcement, let's face it, when it comes to, and I shouldn't say just law enforcement, but also first responders in any way, um, are going to be involved. They're, it's an additional uh, aspect to their job and their response uh, responsibilities when this is completed, wherever it's going to be completed. And we have to think about that, I would think. Um, the uh, one thing I want to mention is that the statistics in Mr. Burton's email and I know this has been a common theme, is that it will increase property values. I keep hearing that on paper, but I don't see anything on paper. I don't see any statistics provided. I don't see any hardcore evidence whatsoever. Uh, so I, again, I have to question that. Um, I can see for commercial properties, if you own a, a donut shop or a coffee shop or something like that, yes, the added traffic would help your business. But for a homeowner, I don't see it. Uh, a, home, a prospective home buyer is going to look at two homes, they're going to see that going on in their backyard versus a home that is of equal size and value and whatnot that does not have that, of course. More likely they're going to choose the, the house that does not have that. Um, 
I talked to Clearwater Police Department representatives, Pinellas County Sheriff's Department representatives, Tarpon Springs Police Department representatives, and I'm not saying I spoke to hundreds, but the few that I did speak with said that there was additional calls and suspicions and activity and even incidents along the trail. Um, I was even told that there was a police officer shot and killed. I don't know if they were, you know, again, terrible, terrible incident if that took place in the South Clearwater Bell area, <coughs> Bell Air area, <coughs> excuse me. I don't know whether they, if it was fatal or not, it really doesn't, it does matter, but we're talking about criminal activity, period. And anything to do, misdemeanor, felony, I would think it would all be of equal concern. Um, again, if that took place, I, my thoughts and prayers go out to that family, but it's, a, it's another aspect to please think about this before you go forward. This is gonna be a decision that impacts generations to come in this county. And I know on paper it looks good, there's an empty grassy area underneath the power lines, let's use it. Just like in sports, you hear announcers say, on paper they should win the championship this year. They've got all the stars. On paper, this sounds like a slam dunk. Just like the prior uh, individual gentleman that was up here talking, it sounds like a slam dunk. Make a path on a grassy area, <coughs> you're done. There's a lot more to this, safety concerns, criminal activity, first responders trying to get to these areas that are behind homes and hard to get to in certain areas. Um, we feel very strongly that the McMullen, Bout, McMullen Booth route is much, much more of an intelligent choice. Um, yes, you do pass over some driveway areas, but you're, the, the users of the trail would be going in the same direction as the traffic. And yes, the traffic does have to yield just like they would if, it was going across, if the crossing was going across 580 or Countryside Boulevard or Curlew. Either way, you, you're relying on the responsibility of drivers. And with, I'd rather go along with the traffic the same direction than try to cross it. So that, that's my point. Crossing traffic is a lot different than going the same direction as traffic. More and more today we see texting, I hate to say it, but drivers that are texting and trying, always in a hurry, trying to accomplish things as they're driving, which is the wrong thing to do. But we know we can't be foolproof in knowing that it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. And we don't want somebody to die. Again, please keep in mind you're going, the proposed route is not, it's crossing traffic in many areas. The McMullen, Bo McMullen Booth route would be going in the same direction. You've also got uh, Meese Countryside Hospital. Hospital services right there that would be right by the trail if it went down McMullen Booth. You've got the Clearwater Police substation there right by Countryside High School. You've got the ability for law enforcement to be right by the trail if something happened. Um, another big thing that I'm huge on that I'd like to point out, it's very easy to forget this fact, but um, if the Duke Energy power lines are used, you're behind homes and you're not in public view at all. Along McMullen Booth, you would be in plain sight just as it already exists in East Lake. I don't hear about any problems a wide, beautiful trail right off the road. I don't see any safety issues. You're in public view and people using the trail know they're in public view and they behave accordingly. When you're behind homes and you know you're not in public view, who knows how you're gonna behave? You've got all walks of life. You've got the priests and nuns using the trail. You've got the people that just got out of prison. You don't know what walk of life is gonna be using the trail. When you're behind homes, we're relying on their on their uh, good behavior. And I'd rather not rely on their behavior, I'd rather have them in public view. My choice. Okay. I ho hopefully you agree. We've reached our six minutes. Okay. Um, she was doing it on her cell phone oh, I'm sorry. rather than right. there. So. I was like, well, it's not moving. I know, you were trying to figure <laughs> it out, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Okay. appreciate it. Um, that's all the cards that I have on this agenda item. Is there any further discussion? Comment. Um, Scott, um, at the, Scott and I met and um, I told him I, th I thought that in years to come, if we decided to go in a different direction, he'd come back and regret that decision because a lot of folks that have the, the trail in their backyard have really 
taken to it. Um, I do I do have some information here which I will send you that I got from a gentleman over in Tampa on the economic impact of trails. It's not, you know, some in some areas it's a little bit higher, in some areas it's a little bit lower, but generally speaking, overall there wasn't much change, maybe a little increase, but I'll send that to you so you have that information. Um, uh, I do think the entire picture of, of public safety needs to be looked at here, and, and I do think that the 580 issue is big from a monetary standpoint, from a safety standpoint. Um, I understand the McMullen Booth argument. Um, I'm not sold on that one versus the trail yet, but I do think the trail picture has to include how we're going to get across those roads and at what expense and what issues we have with that. So I'm, I am, I'm concerned enough about it that I, I don't want to just move forward just to move forward and get it done, but that's just me speaking. I think we need to pause a little bit and make sure that we have things done the right way from a safety perspective. So the only comment yes. I have. Okay, thank you very much for um, the update, and I'm sure that there'll be more to follow on this um, on this particular item. Yes. Well, I, I um, just contemplating everything that's been said here. You know, we did have a lengthy discussion of this through the years about for completing the loop. Uh, obviously, these folks who are in this last segment. We're not aware of it or did not participate in that conversation. But I do think um, the issues about the crossings that Commissioner Eggers raised are, are something we need to, to take another look at. The, uh, the safety issue, I really want to make sure we get the facts out there. Um, when you mention an officer was shot, I mean, that, that's very serious. And I, I'm trying to think in my head years ago. when that happened and which officer that was. I'm going back to Jeffrey Tackett. I don't think that was on the trail. Yeah, say it was. It was. It was. It was Jeffrey Five Tackett. Years ago. Twenty-five years ago. It was Jeffrey Tackett years ago. on the trail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And all the times Commissioner Maroney talked about it, I thought it was behind a business. Well, it might but, have been. Okay, so it was kind Jeffrey Tackett. Behind a business. So thank you for bringing that forward. I, I did not remember that. Um, being associated with Officer Tackett. But I can tell you, I ride the trail. I might not look like it, but I do ride the trail um, <laughs> down in uh, St. Pete, Tyrone area, and it's all behind homes. And the places where they had problems um, in the um, section between roughly U.S. 19 and 49th is a section that's not behind homes. And that's why St. Pete moved forward and, and did the traffic or the um, the cameras. That um, I don't think we replicated that countywide, but that had a big impact when they put the cameras in. But um, I do think it's not a bad idea to pause and take a look at those specific issues, um, the safety issues, but all the also the crossings as we move towards completing this project. It's been great for the county, but obviously this these neighborhoods were not engage in that conversation for whatever reason. Maybe it was too far down the line or uh, it was 15, 20 years uh, forward. But I agree with uh, Commissioner Eggers' sentiments on this. I think in that regard, <clears throat> um, I had asked for it but received the wrong studies. But there was a study back in 2008 that looked at Countryside Boulevard, Landmark, and McMullen Booth. I agree that McMullen Booth is not a wise place, in my opinion, with all the commercial and the driveway cuts to be looking at. But I'd like to at least go back and see the rationale behind why they chose this route over landmark and countryside. And I honestly, I, like I said, I tried to find it, but I haven't. And so maybe we can ask staff to send us that summation and executive summary. And then if you all want to pursue having further discussions about it, just mention it to Mr. Burton and we'll kind of go from there. I can't believe that there's something you can't find in your files. I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> I even called Brian Smith. I said, Brian, I'm trying to remember when we looked at this because I remember, but well, of course, I used to live in that neighborhood, so I remember it being considered going up Landmark Drive. And so, um, so, but Commissioner Sale from 2008 to now is a huge big difference in terms of traffic congestion and the way in which areas have been built up. 
So I, I do think that it begs for a, a bigger discussion, and it's part of my report when we come to commission report, but I saw a presentation yesterday called Vision Zero, mm -hmm. and um, it was at the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, and I really would like the county commission to think about doing something like that countywide because one traffic death is one too many, and this new program that they have over in Hillsborough County is reducing accidents and those kind of things exponentially. So I think it's something that we ought to, I mean, it isn't exactly like this, but it does speak to bikers and people out walking and so on and so forth. Um, and I think we've had a presentation of Vision Zero at Forward Pinellas. Yes. Um, and some discussions about it. Um, you know, there's pros and cons in anything. You know, one thing about using, and I think the wisdom and the past behind using the, um, the um, high transmission power line part was because you don't have driveway cuts. You don't have cars that are transversing this. It is dedicated to pedestrians and bicyclists. And from that viewpoint, it is a safer um, piece of it. But crossing the roads, as we've just discussed, and although there's plans to do beacons and lights and so on, let's just, let's just take one last review of it and then um, go forward. Yeah, just, could I just add one? I mean, oh, I'm sorry. I'm let's sorry. have one. We'll put it on a work session. We'll have one last look at it so you look at the past present and why the recommendations were made and you know etc and we'll let you all know when that meeting is scheduled mm -hmm. we'll let you know when the meeting is scheduled okay yes just wanted what you had asked for uh, the two the, the 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 rationale behind the choices mm -hmm. there was also a change it was a subtle change but it was well, not subtle it was a subtle comparison between metal law metal Meadow, what was it? Meadow Wood. Yeah, versus North Side, because when you go down Meadow Wood, you really literally on the side that they're talking about are, I mean, you could reach out and touch a house. It was, mm -hmm. I mean, it's right there and there's no fencing there. So I'd just like to take that and look at the rationale between about why it was chosen over North Side as well. So it's all it's the same. I think the same work has already been done. So if we just bring that back. And then whatever efforts we've had with uh, for funding for any of these overpasses, just to see if there's any of that. Because I did ask him to look into that and get back to us with what he suggestions he might have. So we'll let you know when the meeting is scheduled. Um, if you wish, we're we're done with this part of it, please. But be ha I'm happy to receive a phone call from you in that regard. Okay. Great. And the next item is our 2019 Citizens Value Survey. And here comes Aubrey. Good morning, Commissioners. Aubrey Phillips for the Office of Management and Budget. I'm pleased to join you here today to present the 2019 Citizen Value Survey research findings. This is a high-level summary of the findings. Um, so I'll get right to it. So each year we do a random telephone survey. We have a 3.5% margin of error at a 95% confidence level. So this gives us a broad brush indication of community sentiment around key characteristics and quality <coughs> of life indicators. Highlighting a couple major highlights. One is uh, that 97% of respondents expressed that they had trust in the county. This is compared to a 72% national average, so we're far exceeding our peers across the country in terms of the trust and confidence that the citizens place in county government. <coughs> in general, most residents are optimistic about quality of life in Pinellas County, and throughout the next couple of slides, we'll highlight uh, some of the trends, key data, and what we're doing with this data once we collect it. So nine in 10 residents uh, responded that they would recommend Pinellas County as a place to live, work, raise children, and retire. Uh, those ratings for live and retire have remained consistent over the last couple years, but we've seen improvements in citizen ratings of Pinellas County as a place to work and raise children. 
So digging into some of the quality of life data, 69% uh, of residents are positive, feeling positive about their current quality of life. 79% are positive about their future quality of life. But we want to dig in and understand um, those minority of residents who are feeling pessimistic about their current and future quality of life. So for those who were not optimistic about current and future quality of life, perceptions of traffic and crime, as well as overcrowding and homelessness, um, topped the list in terms of what the concerns were that they were citing as the reasons for their quality of life ratings. Um, looking at data on crime rates in particular, uh, we've not found a correlation between uh, the declines in this area and the, the perceptions that citizens have and actual crime rates. They're, those are trending down. Um, our best uh, estimate based on the data available is that much of that is driven by media coverage of crime. So even if crime rates are declining, if folks are seeing it on the news at home every night, it's going to affect their perceptions of an experience of crime in the community. This was the second year that we asked citizens about how sea level rise impacts their quality of life ratings. And we saw a significant increase from nearly four, uh, about four in 10 residents uh, last year to this year, seven in 10 residents were stating that sea level rise concerns them a great deal or to a certain extent. Um, so that's a significant increase. Again, we're anticipating, we expect that that's primarily caused by increasing media coverage, conversations within the community around sea level rise. So each year we also ask citizens about their expectation and experiences around 21 different community characteristics. These are tied to the goals of our strategic plan as you can see on the slide. Here we have uh, key highlights, so top expectation gaps really centered around traffic flow and support services for disadvantaged residents. Those are the areas where the gap between what citizens expect and what they experience is the largest. Uh, those areas with the smallest gaps between expectation and experience were those primarily related to parks, culture, and a sense of community, as well as availability of jobs that's likely impacted by the approving economy uh, overall. Top expectations are pretty well aligned with those smallest expectation gaps, um, or top experiences, excuse me. Um, regard those are regardless of expectations with presence of parks and public spaces, presence of communities where you can live, work, and play, cultural events and activities, sense of community, and sense of personal safety was also a very highly rated experience. Here, just as a high-level view, this chart shows experience and expectation ratings. As you can see, expectations are high across all of the characteristics. Um, our community expects great things, um, as I think all of us do. Uh, characteristics are arranged clockwise from the largest gap of traffic flow at the top of the chart, um, going all the way around to the smallest gap, which is uh, accessibility of parks, availability of parks and public spaces. So as the economy has improved over the last eight years, we've also seen a decline in the percent of residents planning to move away from Pinellas County uh, in the next year. It's declined from a high of more than 5% in 2017 to uh, in the 2019 survey, it was just under 3%. So that's been a good improvement there. And then lastly, to circle back on the highlight that we started with at the beginning of the day, um, this is trended data showing how trust and confidence has varied over time, ending with uh, the 2019 data, which is 97% trust and confidence. We're really looking to um, use this data to highlight the latest survey results and connect that citizen feedback back with the things that we've done over the past year to address citizens' needs. Because we know that experience is driven by not only the facts on the ground and what's happening out in the community, but also by awareness of what's being done. And so um, I'm going to ask Barbara to come up and share a little bit more about that communication strategy and what we're doing to try to close that gap in awareness. Good morning, Barbara Hernandez, uh, Director of Marketing and Communications. So uh, Aubrey and I are working very closely um, uh, to help message out uh, the information about the Citizen Value Survey results and how that connects back to what our various county departments are doing. So there's several things that we wanted to highlight um, that we're going to be doing moving forward. 
And those include uh, proactive public outreach. So we're working more closely with departments when they have projects or when they submit requests to our department to figure out you know, how does this relate to the Citizen Valley Survey and is there a messaging opportunity? And because we have our strategic communications approach, departments are sending us the requests earlier in the year and so that gives us much more time to plan out what messages we're going to put out. You're, you're also going to be seeing a uh, social media campaign uh, year round. We're going to start that this year and what that's going to do is, so we're messaging out constantly, right? But we're going to connect if there's a project that um, utilities completed or uh, public works completed, we're going to connect that back to this is what you told us was important to you and here's what we're doing. Um, because the work is being done, we're putting out messaging, but the, I think the piece that is going to be different this year is that we're going to connect what we're doing, what we're messaging with, here's what you told us you wanted or here are your expectations. So if we connect that, I think the message is going to be stronger. One other thing that we're working on is our department is expanding its database of community organizations. And so um, I think in the past, departments had their different lists of groups uh, that they talk to. We're compiling that into one master list. And so when we look at what citizens say in North County, Mid, South, we're going to have a stronger pool of resonance that we can reach and say, for North County, this is what you told us was you know, a key priority this year. And so we can target messaging better that way. Um, and then one thing I wanted to share is that you're soon going to uh, see a sampling of that. Uh, we're doing things TV video for the month of April is going to connect Citizen Valley survey results to what our employees are doing. We're going to have some examples of it. Um, and one more thing, and uh, Chair Seal was uh, kind enough to help us last week. Uh, we're working with our media partners to package new stories for them. So um, if they can't come out to an event or to cover a project, we're not just sending a release and letting it sit. We're saying, no, this is very important. So we're preparing a news package. We're getting interview clips. We're getting B-roll, and we're sending it out to them. Uh, usually before the weekend because they've told us weekends is when they have the lowest staffing and uh, they don't have as much ability to go out and cover stories and Sundays are for some of them actually their highest uh, circulation or highest viewership. So we're um, aligning some of those messages again back to the Citizen Value Survey. Excellent. Okay. Is it possible for you, to, may I, Madam Chair? Yes, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it possible for you to also, when you're separating the different pieces of the county, to do a little focus on the beach communities? Because their needs are sometimes very often different from the rest of the county. Yes, we're looking at north, mid, south, and beaches, um, same as uh, the survey, how they break Great. down the results right now. Great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Has. Sounds good. I want to thank you for continuing to um, compare, compare us from year to year. <clears throat> I think by having um, good questions and the same questions year after year helps us to gauge where we have opportunities, where we have challenges, where we um, can do better. And so we thank you and um, everyone for all the hard work and the education outreach as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, we are now at Citizens to be Heard and uh, public comment. We'll start with Stacy Tatum, who is a St. Petersburg College student. And I bet I know whose class you're in. <laughs> Does it start with a K, Dr. K? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. I'm a St. Petersburg College student, but I'm also a Pinellas County resident. I've lived here my entire life. Largo, Clearwater, Seminole. Um, right now, I live in an unincorporated area in Seminole. And for my project um, to graduate with a bachelor's degree, I decided to get uh, try to get streetlights installed in my neighborhood. So um, that's been fun. I've met with Jim Cannon uh, from the Public Works Department, and I got to meet a lot of my neighbors that I didn't know. They start asking me, could I get speed bumps and um, <laughs> other stuff, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm just doing a project. So um, I just came to say thank you for having the street-like district in place for citizens who live in unincorporated areas so that we can advocate for ourselves. And if I, uh, they get installed, I guess I'll see you guys again here if it's approved. So, you know, you guys would approve it. But And that's all I wanted to say, and I'm going to go have lunch. And I hope you all have a nice day. 
Thank, thank you. you. And tell Dr. Crunch and Opal we said hello. I will. Thank you again. Thank, thank you very much yes. for being Mr. here. Mr. Welch, Before wait a you second. Run off? Oh, so you've been there all morning, so. I know. I was cold. I was hungry. I went through a lot of emotions. in here. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and You're welcome. Um, thank you for advocating for your neighborhood. So how did you find the street lighting process? Okay, so I contacted um, the Public Works Department, which is funny because he goes, he's in the same class as me, and he <laughs> okay. told me that's who I needed to contact. I don't know how he knew that, but he did. So um, I contacted them, and they, um, I met with Jim Cannon, someone else named Tyler, and they were really, really helpful. I mean, he sent me a map of my neighborhood, and how many houses I would have to get a signature from okay. for it to get approved. So, yeah, that was And really so the, the lights are on the way? You, well, you, no, I only got nine signatures okay. uh, so far. So, Still you know, I probably need it. to loop around again. Or, okay. But, how yeah. many signatures do you have to get? 32. <laughs> yep, 32. So. All right. Good, good luck. Yeah, it's cool. Thank you. Thanks for your work. Thank you, guys. Y'all have a good day. You too. Thank you Bye -bye. again. Um, Connor... Laporta? Yes. I'm sorry. Did I get that right? Good morning to the commission. And uh, my name is Connor Laporta. Um, I live on 8001 Sailboat Key Boulevard South. I've lived in Pinellas County my entire life. Um, went to school here, went to Seminole Elementary, Osceola Middle School, and then Seminole High School, and now in my final year at SBC. Um, I wanted to first thank Commissioner Justice for meeting with me briefly on this issue. I uh, really appreciate you being uh, gracious with your time. And I uh, wanted to thank the county as well for their continued hard work in making this county a better place to live and also your continued support for SBC. Many of you um, come to our campus on a frequent basis. Um, so so the, the issue that I'm speaking on today is an animal abuse registry system. Um, as part of our capstone project, we were tasked with finding an issue that we care greatly about. Um, two major areas of interest in my life are the study of law and animal welfare issues. So I wanted to really find an area, <clears throat> an issue that those two issues intersected. Um, Hillsborough County in 2016 implemented the first animal abuser registry, um, and the registry functions similarly to uh, a sexual offender list. Uh, the registry requires people who have been convicted of animal cruelty to be placed on a list that prohibits them from purchasing, adopting, or possessing animals uh, for a certain time frame following a conviction of an animal cruelty offense. Um, and there have been many studies done by uh, the FBI, the DOJ, as well as the uh, Animal Legal Defense Fund showing the correlation between animal cruelty and other violent offenses. Um, there was a study done that showed that in homes where animal cruelty had occurred, 88% of these same homes had experienced other forms of violence, such as domestic violence, assault, um, and even in extreme cases, murder. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer is an uh, extreme example, but I think it's illustrative to the correlation that animal cruelty has to other violent offenses. So um, I really implore the county to look at this as a public safety issue. Um, more is just an animal rights issue. Um, we have common sense policies already in place uh, regarding child abuse, elder abuse. We've, as a society, determined that it's important to have a barrier between the abusers and those that are abused. Um, and I don't really think that it should be any different with animals. Um, I, I would really implore the county to maybe take it under consideration uh, to do some sort of feasibility study. Um, I'd be happy to share any of the experts. I interviewed the county attorney in Hillsborough County as well as I spoke with Jay McGill's office um, about enforcement aspects of, of such an ordinance if it were to go into effect. Um, and then I did speak uh, at length with the Humane Society of Pinellas just to kind of see how uh, nonprofits and other businesses in the county would be able to, uh, to work with the county and uh, complying with the ordinance and enforcing it and kind of having a hand-in-hand -hand approach to combating animal abuse in the county. Um, and with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer any. Commissioner? Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and uh, it was great to meet with Connor and hear about his issue and his passion for the subject matter. And I asked him to, when he finished the project, to send me the project, and then I would share it with you all to see where you wanted to go from there. Um, we certainly don't want someone to come adopt animals out of our shelter uh, and then end up in a very bad situation. So any step that we can take to provide that security and safety is something that we should seriously consider. Okay, I appreciate Thank that. you very much. Presentation for is on April 15th, so the finalized binder would... Uh, definitely be sent your way once that's completed. So. <laughs> Thank, you. Okay. Thank, you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for the hard work. Um, David Ballard Geddes is our final speaker. Hi. Thank you again, Commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. What is the, the overarching end game? What is the big picture of government? 
what exactly is being constituted as a useful art for limited times in Article I, Section 8? What is being meant as a ship of war in time of peace in Article I, Section 10? What is meant by captures on land and water, again in Article I, Section 8, declaring intending to assume separate but equal stations among the powers of the earth, declaring when in the course of human events that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are still sufferable. What is meant by George Washington in his farewell address when he states to indirectly undermine that which cannot be directly overthrown, to employ artifices to weaken, to agitate, to mislead, to enfeeble, to cause umbrage, to deeply penetrate using covert, insidious, pernicious, and sinister motives, Washington further stating that we are being given a useful lesson on our heads, useful arts, declaring to complete perfidy and works of death, declaring destruction of all ages and conditions, declaring to eat us out of our subsistence, deaf to the voice of justice, free to levy war as written in the Declaration of Independence, uniformly bankrupting, capturing the water supply as a constitutional objective in Article 1, Section 8, birthing water jurisdictions, claimed as bounty, claimed as process due in the 14th Amendment thereof, taking liberty, property, and life, holding the rest of mankind as an enemy, as declared, and the rectitude of intent as enumerated from Article 1, Section 2 is that one person out of every 30,000 people is to be constituted with privileges and immunities while holding the rest of mankind. The, the posterity of the rest of humanity is to be taxed directly, directly taxed again as verified from Article 1, Section 2. In reality, in actuality, the truth being held, this Constitution here is an invasion. This Constitution is a bill of attainder. This Constitution is a letter of marquee and is an ex post facto law. We've got big problems on the high seas here we need to deal with, and um, it's not going to be easy, but this is what I see that we face, and if this is the problem, that we're going to face against. Let's address these issues and, and let's find a way where we can all move forward and everyone can adjust our sails correctly um, so that, that we can maintain peace. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and we are now ready for County Commission new business items. Um, agenda item 42, the Municipal Services Taxing Unit Funding Request, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, um, appreciate uh, you all considering the request by the uh, the FIXA group. Uh, they are <coughs> diligent and get their, their requests in every year. And I, as I said to you during the meeting last Thursday, they I told them that uh, we needed to wait a little bit and let's let others uh, come forward with their projects. Um, uh, I think everybody probably got the summary of the MSTU projects that we spent to date um, uh, by, by different uses, by different organizations, excuse me. Um, and certainly, I think at this point, the FIXA folks are somewhere around 40% of the total dollars used, which is kind of reflective of the percent of the population that, uh, that they represent uh, as, uh, as a percentage of the unincorporated area in Pinellas County. So I don't think that they're, they're over asking. The projects are all uh, uh, good, sound projects, and uh, there, there's four additional ones. Um, uh, I think the one from the community center, excuse me, the rec center in Palm Harbor to do something with our um, White Chapel, and not the White Chapel, but the, the facility next door and get some a sound attenuation in there will be greatly appreciated by folks that use that room for, for meeting spaces so that you can actually have good conversation and the echoing in there is, is, is not good. So I think that'll be a, a good project. The project uh, <coughs> at the library in Palm Harbor is for a car, the, 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 and it would be about expanding the mobile services from the library to reach out to communities and retirement homes. Um, and apparently they've raised 16,000 of the 36,000 is needed, so the 20,000 that the county would be providing through MSTU would provide uh, that car. So I think that uh, they've gotten com obviously some community support there, which is important. Um, and over in Eastlake, uh, some additional 
um, uh, facilities, uh, uh, stands in the East Lake Recreation Area, stands and uh, facilities so that folks can see games, uh, participate or watch games in some comfort. There's just no shade up there at all. I think that's a good use of, of the funds as well. Uh, and then the finishing off the improvements down at the library in East Lake, where they've just spent a lot of funds here from from the county, from the state to to do the expansion. And when you go through there, you can definitely see the front area that it just is so old in the, in, from the carpeting perspective that this is this will be a needed uh, addition, and it would blend in with the new construction that's gone on there. So I think there's four good projects and. With these, uh, with these um, approximately twenty thousand dollars per project, and our percentage of the total, ours being FIXA, uh, would uh, rise above fifty percent. But we have a whole six months to go, and many more projects to consider. Um, as you can see, we've spent about four hundred and forty-four thousand. There's still, uh, am I right in reading that there's three hundred eighty-six thousand, Barry, un, uh, still uh, uncommitted but budgeted? I believe so. I'd have okay. to report. But it's anyway, on it's on this sheet that yes. you got. If there's any questions, did you get this? Is it part of the agenda package in our legislative? I can't. I don't think so. Separate email. I think this was sent separately. Okay. Separately. Okay. So anyway, I would move approval of those four projects. Second. Okay. Um, there's been a motion by Commissioner Egger, second by Commissioner Justice, um, to fund these uh, requests. And we'll go ahead and pull up the voting ballot. I just ask, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm go supportive. Ahead. I just wanted you to, um, what's that remaining balance again? Um, I think this yep. it says remaining uncommitted from total budgeted $386,000. 386. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bill, is that right? There is total unspent of $435,402.37. You be more specific. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and thank you, Bill, for sending us this information. Yep, that was great. Okay. Um, we have unanimous approval. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate um, it. Thank you so much. And now we'll move on to County Commission Board Reports and Miscellaneous. We'll start with Commissioner Welch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's been a while since we had a meeting, mm -hmm. um, but I did um, have the opportunity to attend the FAC Legislative Day a couple weeks ago. Um, that particular day, I did run into Commissioner Justice. Uh, and Brian Lowack, of course, uh, met with um, us individually with our legislators. Barry was up there as well. Um, so my legislators were uh, Senators Brandis, uh, Rusan, and Representative Webb. Um, you know, FAC was focused, again, there seems to be another push on uh, preemption against local governments. Uh, one of the bills would require a, a referenda like the penny for Pinellas to, uh, in the House version, require a supermajority of this commission to put it on the ballot and then 66 percent of the public vote uh, for it to win. And, of course, um, that's draconian. We're opposing that. The Senate version only asked uh, that it happens during a general election, which I think is much more reasonable. Um, again, there were... Um, bills that would affect CRAs. Um, there was a bill that would uh, uh, affect the composition of the TDC. And I don't know if you all had a chance to talk about that, Madam mm -hmm. Chair, where um, if, a, if a county had a population higher than 900,000, they could have more than one Tourist Development Council. And I uh, had a good uh, discussion with Senator Roussan on that one. And the way I'm reading it, and I haven't had a chance to talk with Brian, it seems like that decision would still be made by this commission. Uh, even if we had that authority, this commission would still have to make the decision that we need more than one tourist development council. <laughs> but, but um, Commissioner Welch, it doesn't, yes, it doesn't have a house companion, does it? I thought I saw one. I was just on the website now. So I thought I saw one, but I can't say 100% that it does. Um, so quite a few bills like that out there, but it was a productive day. I think our um, legislative team uh, from um, the Southern Strategies is doing a real good job uh, walking us through and staying on top of the process. want to wish the best to Davin Suggs, our FAC legislative director, who had some health issues. I think he's out uh, until June 1st. So I want to send him prayers and uh, healing vibes as well. And then last night I was... Uh, honored to join uh, our Vice Chair and Commissioner Justice 
Long and uh, Eggers, who I said was from Tarpon Springs. I only had 30 <laughs> seconds on the mic, so I just was thinking North County and then said Tarpon. Um, with FAST, and we were celebrating this county's uh, continued commitment to affordable and workforce housing going back to 2006 with the original Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the $15 million for the land trust in this penny, and then the 82.5 that we've allocated in the next penny. Uh, it's a strong track record for this uh, county commission, and we wanted to thank FAST for their partnership. And uh, for Pinellas, I think, meets tomorrow, Mr. Chairman? Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, so that's all I have for today. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Peters. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it has been a while um, since we met last. Um, I, I took some, some staff, Lourdes and some staff went to Miami and um, we um, toured some of the mental health providing or programs that they're utilizing down in Miami. Uh, we had great conversations with Judge Leifman. He's really the driver down, down there and um, some of their reform that they're doing. Most of their initiatives are going through the justice system. Um, which may be different than what we're looking at, but they do have some uh, things that we could implement if we were to choose. Um, I also have quite a few um, tours coming up. We'll be going down to Sarasota tomorrow to tour their facility, Orlando later in the month to tour their facility. Um, interesting, I was in Bermuda this weekend and actually went past the uh, mental hospital in Bermuda and had a long conversation with the residents there and um, they do something completely different there. They don't have a stigma problem. And they do a wellness center. So all their mental health facilities are wellness centers and they open it up to the entire community to do yoga classes and all kinds of health fitness classes and people can check themselves in for mental health breaks. Um, they also do something similar to Baker Axe there, but it's, it's very different where it's uh, looked at very much as wellness and it's connected to all kinds of physical and mental wellness everything program all in one facility so it was kind of interesting that on my vacation I I couldn't help myself but stopped by the mental hospital there but um, um, also I was in uh, Tallahassee as well uh, for the fact days um, I met with everyone in our delegation except Senator Brandis um, but I also took the time to meet with uh, the secretary of DOT the assistant deputy uh, attorney general to talk about the new fentanyl in Pinellas County. Um, and I spent some time with um, DEP to discuss inlet management um, and some other water quality issues that um, I think are really important in Pinellas County. So um, it was kind of nice to meet with those folks. A lot of them are new, so I didn't know them. I had a meeting with the governor, but it got changed. So unfortunately, I'll have to go back up there and, and get to know him a little better. Um, but it was been uh, really great. So I went to the Early Learning Coalition as well, and they're doing a strategy now to look at more uh, fundraising and sustainability without having to count, uh, count on just government funding. Um, so I'm going to wish them a lot of luck in their new venture of trying to raise money. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a very busy month. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the board's uh, area agency on aging, on April 26th, the annual lunch, annual meeting and luncheon will be held at the Largo Performing Arts Center. Uh, you should have received an invitation for that. Uh, uh, hopefully, if you're able, you will attend. Um, the Gulf Consortium, uh, we met in Tallahassee as part of the uh, Association of Counties Week, and uh, uh, we have had the first real vote on actually expending some funds and in that first list is $1.2 million that will come to Pinellas County for our, to contribute to the Lake Seminole project. So uh, how many years later after the BP, we'll see some of the actual environmental impacts uh, funds spent in Pinellas County. Historic preservation, and the next meeting will be also associated with the FAC meeting in uh, Orlando uh, with the annual uh, FAC meeting. Historic preservation, um, our last meeting was held at the uh, Reba Sutton White Chapel and uh, we got official signage and designation of that property uh, for historic significance. And we had some of the Sutton family uh, there, and it was a very special day for the family to see the, the monument go up. Um, we had a first look at a review for a certificate of appropriateness for the old J.C. Craver General Store 
which became the Masonic Lodge on Florida Avenue. Uh, there's a new, an owner of the property who wants to do some improvements there. Uh, so we did a first review of that and we will do a, a final approval at our April meeting. Um, also in the historic preservation area, uh, we did receive a state grant which was used for a uh, first initial survey of historic properties in the Lelman community. And we're also currently applying for a grant that will help us with a survey of historic bridges in Pinellas County. So some neat things going on there. Homeless Leadership Board, we met last week. Uh, the primary discussion, and um, uh, let me thank you again for appointing me to that committee. Um, the primary- For serving. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm still learning, and we're finally, we did make a concentrated effort uh, last week to not talk in acronyms, which was very helpful to members of the public and myself, uh, because there was, that is an acronym riddled uh, uh, meeting if there's ever, ever one. But a lot of the talk and the most of the, the meeting was spent around setting the priorities of uh, target populations for our HUD funding. So there was a decision on that as far as our HUD application. Um, so that was decided. Um, Stormwater Wastewater Task Force, our uh, next meeting will be May 23rd at SPC Seminole, and that will have a presentation and update uh, for the public. Uh, Gulf Consortium, surface water. Um, just some of the community events that have uh, happened that I think many of us have been attending. Uh, the Firefighters MDA Chili Blaze, uh, Commissioner Welch and I were there, Commissioner Peters, and most of us survived that evening. <laughs> uh, the March 18th CNC and annual meeting, uh, the St. Pete Police uh, Headquarters grand opening uh, was a beautiful day there. Uh, Florida Dream Center's Walk for the Block for Hunger, Boys and Girls Club Youth of the Year Breakfast, uh, Oldsmar Day Parade with Commissioner Eggers. Uh, had the privilege of speaking with the Kona, which is Council of Neighborhood Associations in St. Petersburg, their leadership program last week, and um, filled in for Commissioner Long at the Military Order of World Wars Clearwater Chapter in Bel Air last week. And uh, if you have a chance to uh, go to that lunch and meet with those folks, uh, it is a time that you will not regret. Uh, I sat next to a gentleman who was uh, the sharpest guy in the room, but uh, at 22 he flew into Normandy, uh, and he had some incredible stories to share with the with the group, and just a really special group. Uh, also attended the Business Professional Women's Unhappy Hour, and also with Fast last night. And then just in closing, Madam Chair, uh, Courtney told me this morning that we have confirmed our Pure Pinellas uh, visitor for our April 23rd meeting. And uh, Mr. Brosey might need some extra work uh, to set that preparation up, but uh, it's going to be a good one. So. Oh, good. I'm looking Thank forward you. to it. <laughs> We've all been great so far, so um, and it's giving us all good yeah. history lessons and um, more knowledge of what's available in Pinellas County. So thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Gerard. Okay. Um, we had a career source meeting last week, I think it was, where we decided or to enter negotiations with the city of St. Pete for the Science Center. They had the highest bid and they need some land for their uh, treatment plant, which is right behind that property. I didn't even realize that until, I, <laughs> until we had the meeting there. And I went, oh. But they're also gonna do some uh, mm. affordable housing there, which they're getting quite a lot of pressure to do. So probably half and half of that land. That's quite a big area actually. Um, let's see what else. Um, not much in the way of meetings. PSTA, of course, is talking a lot about funding from the county and or other sources. Um, there is a public hearing tomorrow to talk about uh, projected cuts. Uh, so we'll see what the public has to say about that. We've gotten some feedback already. Um, the uh, youth. Advisory Committee met at Animal Services last month. They're planning a volunteer day at, uh, or they did have a volunteer day, no, April 13th, that's this, sun, this Saturday, um, at Heritage Village, and they're gonna wrap up the year at the Medical Examiner's Office, which ought to be interesting. Um, I went to the Workforce Board's conference, I can't remember what they call it, but uh, in Washington, D.C., just to learn a bit more about what other workforce boards do and how they're coping with things, and just got the sense that we're on the right track, you know, so that's good. Um, there are some big issues coming up for workforce boards having to do with the gig economy and older workers, you know, workers over 50 who are 
being displaced but still need to work for probably another 15, 20 years. Um, so that will be a challenge for everybody going forward. Um, had a tour of PIE with Congressman Christ. I did a 4-H <laughs> competition, judge, judged a 4-H competition. Those kids are impressive, let me tell you. There was one that was talking about brain chemistry and how, or brain development, and uh, I didn't know, understand half of what she was saying, <laughs> but um, it was very interesting. Uh, let's see. And uh, Mr. Justice, I'm surprised you didn't mention farm share. Friday. It's on my I forgot list here. Friday at uh, <laughs> in front of the Pinellas County Housing Authority building on Olmerton. So. Okay, before we leave, Commissioner Gerard, just as a reminder, come May we need to find a replacement for her for yes, the Youth Advisory Committee. Do you mind? Could you share maybe a sample schedule? Sure. So that people could look at it and see if it's going to fit in their calendars. Yeah. We generally meet on Wednesday afternoon, what, third Wednesday, I think? Third Wednesday? Four, four, four fifteen. The kids actually decide um, where they want to go, so you can shape that a little bit. And you meet September through May, generally? Uh, yeah, August is the forming committee, mm -hmm. as soon as school's back in, um, yeah, so you have the summer off. Okay. And Lynn, or Whitney would be glad to help whoever, whoever's assistant ends up helping you with this. So she has a lot of stuff. Okay. Very good. Um, Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, our forward Pinellas meeting is tomorrow. So at the next commission, I'll give an update on, on what we kind of get into Can I, tomorrow. Thank yes. you so much for sending us those summaries. That helps. Did it? Okay, yeah, good. Then we'll continue to do that. After, there. Yeah. Yeah. after each meeting, we uh, they do a good job of pulling that together. So I think it's probably a lot better to kind of look through that. And if you have any questions, certainly you can bring them up here if you'd like. Um, at my VA, this or my we call it Community Veteran Engagement Board, um, I had asked that we take a look at uh, the work that we had done uh, determining the location of the Purple Heart Monument. Um, and you'd be glad to know that uh, the board there that has a lot of members from, you know, Purple Heart community and different groups uh, said that they uh, liked the, the location that was chosen. I'm sure that'll be coming back to the commission more formally. But um, so they were supportive of the process and also of the location down next to uh, the VA. So just wanted to pass that along, among other things that we discussed. Um, Tampa Bay Water, obviously, we will be talking on Monday probably to make a decision on the uh, memorandum of understanding uh, with the city of Tampa regarding the TAP project. So um, I'm sure that will be a not be a short meeting. There will be lots of uh, conversation, but we've been talking about this and discussing it for about two years, and I think that uh, um, we need to make a decision and, uh, and move on from there. So that will be... Uh, coming up and again I'll give you uh, an update uh, following uh, the meeting um, and where we go from there. Um, we had a meeting of our TMA this past Friday. It was really good. We went uh, we tried to get out of there right at noon but we talked about a, a, a lot of things including um, how we're going to deal with regional priorities. Uh, we did approve uh, for this year the I-275, I-60 uh, West Shore Interchange as our first one, but I-75 interchain at Gibsonton, I-75 interchange overpass at Overpass, Central Avenue bus rapid transit, and I-275 operational improvements uh, north of the downtown Tampa area. So uh, and there was a lot of discussion about this, uh, the Central Avenue bus rapid transit, and I thought staff um, did a really good job to explain the process that we've been going through to get to the point we have, and maybe you can talk about that a little bit more, but I think people were generally uh, comfortable. Uh, the, the regional look at that regional project, I think people were very comfortable with where we are in that process. So um, it, was a good, it was a good meeting uh, from the board, uh, from the TMA board. Uh, just on, a, on, on some other things uh, that I've uh, been up to, um, uh, I was lucky enough uh, to be, I guess, lucky enough to be appointed to the Florida Healthy Kids um, 
uh, becoming, uh, you know, dealing with uh, health insurance for, for kids, uh, some m mid to low cost, preferably for all kids in Florida. That's the effort. I know that you said you've been on that before, so thank you for your for your note. Um, we'll be going up there next Wednesday to, to meet with the folks and get indoctrinated. There's a strategic planning me meeting in uh, Orlando next month uh, to discuss the di new direction, uh, continued direction and new direction of new board, a new chairman of the board, so of, of that board. So there's going to be a lot of activity. I'm, I'm excited to, to get involved with that. Um, you mentioned the Old Smart Day Parade. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really good. Also had a, a visit from Ann Vanek um, Dasovich. Anyway, from the SELF program um, that, that they're utilizing down in St. Petersburg, and I found it to be interesting, and certainly, um, I, I certainly liked what I heard uh, an awful lot. And the issues that I've been having with the PACE program certainly don't have it with that program, and I know we'll be having more discussion about that uh, coming forward. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is that um, uh, Alyssa Nelson uh, was, uh, was killed uh, back in the early 80s. Um, and uh, walking to school one day, I think, uh, um, I can't remember what time of the year, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and she was abducted and, 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 and killed. And so years later, the family has uh, got some uh, comfort in the, uh, through, through the judici judicial system. Uh, um, but in any event, they've created this Ele Eliza's Greatest Wish group. And, uh, and in its first four years, just so you know, they've raised over $500,000 for causes in the community that um, a lot of, you know, the, for, they'll give some funding to the Girl Scouts that, you know, a lot of groups that it, they're dedicated to the kids, kids programs. Um, and um, last year they raised $90,000. The race is this Saturday, the 5K is at 8 o'clock. And yours truly, I'm going to try to trudge around that course and not, not embarrass the commission, but I'm looking forward to that. Um, they have generally about 900, had last year 900 that entered the race, and they had over 100 volunteers. This race is becoming bigger and bigger. They do it at Walsingham. Um, probably too, I don't know if it's too late to do it online or register online, but you can certainly do it at 6.30 in the morning um, on uh, this, this Saturday. The race starts, the 5K starts at 8 o'clock, and I think there's a one-mile walk, jog, whatever, um, at 9 o'clock. So, and it's a full day of activities and all really focusing on uh, the groups that come forward looking for funding uh, from the Elisa's Greatest Wish Foundation. So great organization. Uh, and uh, yeah, you probably heard by now that the school board uh, did vote to rename the elementary school, the new elementary school in Palm Harbor, after her. So a lot of folks gave input. A lot of people were there at the, at the meeting. I talked to a school board member, and there was other issues that were being considered, uh, and I'm, I'm glad they thought through all of it, but in the end, I think it was a unanimous choice to, to rename the school. So um, really, that's all I have today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Long. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, um, first of all, I was in Tallahassee this week and did not go with FAC because I had already been scheduled to go up this week. On Tuesday, we... <clears throat> last week, I mean, we had 16 meetings on Tuesday while we were in the Capitol, and it was an exhausting but very productive day. We were very well received. Um, primarily, my focus while I was there was transportation, and especially as it related to T. Barta. We did not have a board meeting in March, but we do have one coming up this month with some very important issues that we will be discussing. Our appropriation request for $1.5 million for T. Barta has morphed now into 4.8 because there are several other projects that instead of doing line items that have been requested from various places around the region, and instead of doing line items, they're put, lumping it all together and running it through T. Barta. And um, the ultimate number for that appropriation, of course, will be decided during conference. Our amendments that we offered to help make the board process easier with regard to um, the requirement for quorums and people actually being present, et cetera, are all being very favorably received and are moving forward. 
as it relates to a couple of the questions that I think Commissioner Gerard and Commissioner Eggers spoke to with regard to PSTA and the BRT process, we are in the throes of rebranding the acronym BRT to RTS, which stands for Rapid Transit Service, to better reflect what it is that we're trying to do on that Central Avenue line that goes down to St. Pete Beach. Some of you may have seen the not so favorable article that was in the paper on Saturday with regard to the last commission meeting. And um, Mr. Miller and I are going to St. Pete Beach Council meeting tonight to um, correct the public agenda with regard to information that was thrown out there during the meeting about the lack of transparency with regard to our federal application. 